inviting me to give a talk here. This is the first time I'm trying this uh, virtual thing. Um, let me press this one. Um, yeah, I changed the title a little bit because um, uh, I wanted to not just talk about the EV taxi, but also um, about uh, how the electronic structure align and how we try to characterize it, at least. Um, I will just start. Um, as you know, I'm a, or oh, some of you know, I'm a, both working for as a, a professor at the Niels Bohr Institute, but so, also- Sorry, Peter, I, I have to have to interrupt you. You are not on full screen with your presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see how I do that. Okay, I can do Is it working? Uh, no, uh, now it's fine, yes. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. So I'm uh, uh, working at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen, but also as a principal investigator um, at Microsoft, at the Microsoft Quantum Research Lab in Copenhagen. And uh, it's a global collaboration around the world. There's different sites uh, around the world. Here's uh, they put in. Uh, uh, the map, and you see there's two sites in the, in Copenhagen. There's uh, the Niels Bohr Institute where uh, Charlie Markus is running a big lab, and uh, then just 10 kilometers north of Copenhagen, we have built up a, a, a material, quantum materials lab uh, the last two years from scratch, um, and uh, with a focus on <coughs> building a, a a, a fabrication tool for for quantum materials and devices. Um, here you can see a picture of the lab from outside. It's very visible, so there's no nothing to hide. Here in the uh, this was the uh, early days after one year, uh, and now it's two years ago, and uh, and now we have been running two years, and it's much more. Uh, stainless steel in, inside the lab. To get an overview of what we, uh, uh, where we are at today, um, we have a clean room and in connection to the clean room, we have uh, this load lock that leads into uh, the UHV line, uh, ultra high vacuum. And then we have divided into three sections. Uh, the first section is uh, uh, based on three, five materials. Uh, here where we have a degassing station also with the atomic hydrogen cleaning for which is very useful for many purposes. I will also touch, uh, talk a little bit about that today. And uh, then we have a gate valve which uh, separates from uh, section two where we have a different type of chambers uh, we are using for in situ fabrication. Um, and we are using stencils uh, aligned stem cells in situ to grow our devices. So in principle, uh, we are aiming to have um, fabrication completely without any, um, it, uh, without breaking the vacuum at any stage. So, and then we have a uh, section three, which is uh, still under uh, construction. And uh, this is a, a group four based MBE that sits here, uh, also with thin cell fab and oxidation chamber um, for making junctions and dielectrics and also multi-layer uh, superconductors as we're also doing in section two. Uh, I don't have time to go into all the, of course, what we're doing in, in these uh, uh, chambers, but um, also say we have an, a cobbled STM and SEM in the USB line. Um, and if you know anybody or yourself are interested in uh, joining uh, the development of this uh, fabrication tool, then uh, we're always looking for talents. Okay, <clears throat> the semiconductor platforms we typically start with uh, uh, is these uh, three different types. 
uh, we have the planar ones, which we is uh, the simple case because you only need to consider one type of interface typically. Uh, this is what you uh, also do for when you grow two decks and so on. And then we, with uh, lithography, define our nanowires afterwards. Uh, and then there is, a, a, of course, the VLS wires and SAC wires. And I assume most of you are familiar with these platforms. Um, for hybrid ebotaxi, that's really uh, uh, when you grow crystals together con uh, of different type of uh, space groups, or you can say different uh, um, crystal symmetries. And uh, this is, of course, not the same as saying uh, they will be, it's hybrid uh, materials, as we typically say when we hybridize uh, different type of electronic properties together, but it's often the uh, uh, two different type of crystals give different type of uh, electronic properties, of course. Um, <clears throat> and there's really a lot of materials to explore out there, of course. There's 230 different crystal symmetry groups. And um, on a, the, each of these symmetry groups, we can, of course, put different atoms inside. Uh, as um, This I was a note slide for last year, but um, at that stage, there was uh, already 210,000 known crystals being characterized at different synchrotrons. So there's a lot of things to explore. And uh, another thing I also want to highlight is uh, <clears throat> there was this paper a couple of years ago uh, where they took these uh, crystal structures from the databases and uh, calculated their electronic band structure. And they found that uh, of the, at least of the 24,000 first examined materials, more than 4,000 of these ones has non-trivial non -trivial topological bands. So there's really a lot of possibilities out there. Of course, it's very difficult to realize them. Uh, it depends on so many things. But uh, uh, there's a lot of things to explore. And so maybe I should also emphasize here, this is single materials. And when we grow materials together, then the space of new materials just uh, explode, of course. Because when you take materials together, uh, grow them together, you form a, not only two different, uh, the band, you don't, cobbled just the band structure of two different materials, you actually form a third material because you have different chemistry at the interface. And uh, <clears throat> what is uh, interesting and, uh, and uh, but also difficult to understand it, what is the interface properties? That's something that's typically difficult to characterize and therefore also neglected in, in most uh, um, analysis. <clears throat> Um, but the reason why it's important is that it determines uh, actually the properties of the hybrid material. It determines uh, <clears throat> the, uh, if there is uh, any additional states appearing due to the chemistry at the interface. As you know, there is, if you can put two insulators together and then you can get a conducting layer at the interface between these two. So it's really important that we also understand the interface when we put materials together. And moreover, for the bulk, uh, for the hybridization of the bulk bands, um, it also determines uh, the Fermi level pinning. So when you have a metal together with a semiconductor of holes, you, you pin at the interface. And um, because it's difficult to, to change the potential at the interface uh, due to the chemistry at this interface. So you really, how they bands the line uh, really depends on the interface, which I will talk about. So what is we want in order to form these uh, minor bound states, um, then we really want to have uniform hybridization along the length of these nanowires. That means that we want to couple the superconductor with the semiconductor and uh, it has to be in a uniform way, so we keep uh, this hybridization uh, along the length of the wire in order to reach topological protection. And you don't break the topological phase. Uh, if you just take a, a cut through a 
a nanowire, as shown in this paper here a couple of years ago. Um, when you take a semiconductor, this is in case of 100 nanometers of uh, intermastonite together with aluminum, uh, 5 nanometer aluminum, then you get something like this, where in the ideal, this really ideal case, uh, you see these uh, console well uh, states with large level separation. You have this uh, energy scale of electron volt on the side. And that's simply what, uh, in principle, you will break up the bands of the aluminum, and you can also see uh, level separations in the intermass night. And then uh, the coupling takes place typically around the, the Fermi level. And uh, this was, is, in principle, what we'd expect. The, the challenge with this is that um, this energy scale here, if you change the thickness of the aluminum just by one monolayer, then it seems like you're away off um, in the, in the uh, diagram. But, uh, <clears throat> um, but because of, uh, you don't always have perfect materials, you have a little bit of uh, roughness and so on, then it seems like it's smearing out. And this is also something I will, uh, I will show. And this is for our benefit. Um, <clears throat> just to get in a, uh, into perspective here, um, when you take a metal or a, just in vacuum and put it together with a semiconductor like intermassonite, then either you can uh, you can pin it above the Fermi level and form a Schottky barrier, or you pin it in below or in the gap, of course, also in case of flat band. Um, <clears throat> With intermassonite, uh, it is just a property of intermassonite almost on all interfaces that it tends to pin uh, in the conduction band, and then you form some uh, some some confined bulk states at the interface to the to the metal or vacuum and so on. Um, but this also means that the, the band gap we have uh, is the, is actually what we measure is uh, is like a confined bulk gap and not the or can confine to interface uh, gap, uh, not the same as the bulk gap without confinement. Okay, move on here. Um, so as I showed in the, our laboratory, we have this STM bolted on uh, our fabrication tool or crystal growth uh, USB line. And uh, if you go down and uh, measure uh, on an uh, intermarsonite uh, surface, this is grown by MB. Um, and then you uh, measure density of states uh, with tunnel spectroscopy. Uh, then you can uh, see that you get some steps close to the Fermi level, and this is what we interpret as the confined bulk states. So this will be the first subband. It has a 2D nature, and this is the second one. And then it goes outside um, the Fermi level here. And this is very useful. We can uh, map uh, across the wafer and we uh, uh, measure these uh, positions that uh, vary a little bit, but it's pretty consistent from uh, device to device. So we get uh, uh, subbands typically on intermass one on a surfaces uh, around. Uh, this is, of course, without gating. <clears throat> um, around minus uh, 120 uh, milli electrons and, and 40, minus 40, so below the Fermi level. And with that, we uh, can use some calculations done by uh, Jan Gugelberger from uh, Microsoft, where he has uh, calculated k.p and also uh, Skronik Poisson using uh, uh, the bulk uh, effective mass. And then we can say what, looking at the positions of these uh, confined states, we can, we can find the um, where the uh, band offset, um, what we, we expect the band offset to arise at the interface. But more than that, uh, let me see if we can move to this one. So, um, some, we can also zoom in and actually get much more, uh, uh, because the, the surface probe of STM, that's really good to also measure what is going on at the very interface. So here you see you have some, uh, Again, the same bulk states as I just showed. Uh, the, um, the gray color behind is the derivative. And then you can see you have two bulk states here. But you also have some fine features in the gap when you 
really go in detail. And uh, then we could say like, we have been discussing is this tip effects or how do we, uh, how can it conduct through the bulk gap? Is it a surface conduction and so on? Um, but this is a pretty consistent that we see states in the gap of this particular service. <clears throat> Um, an important thing here is that um, it, the band offset uh, really varies a lot from wafer to wafer, even if it's the same uh, type of surface. And it depends very much on uh, the crystal growth recipe we are using, uh, the quality of the surface, and also for the same improved uh, crystal growth recipe, if you, in, if you process on it afterwards. In this case, we capped it uh, over here with uh, arsenic, amorphous arsenic on top of the surface. We have, uh, then we take it, uh, take it out, we blow off the arsenic and clean it with atomic hydrogen to clean it up. This is typically what you do uh, when you collaborate across uh, different sites with different uh, equipment and so on. This is what we typically say, this is the cleanest way to do it. But you also leave uh, many uh, islands and island vacancies under the surface is what we can see with the STM. This is not typically something we, we can uh, see with, uh, with AFM, for example, um, afterwards, uh, after it's oxidized. Here is really, really clear. And on the same one, we, if we don't put a MOS on and and decap it, uh, it's much cleaner. And also the band offset uh, really changed a lot. So these are uh, 80 millimeter volt difference um, is the difference between whether you have uh, uh, two or three or maybe one or two uh, um, confined bulk states. Um, and so you know, of course it matters a lot uh, in the density in the semiconductor. Um, <clears throat> what I can say now is that we also have uh, done a, a it's not easy just to get a nice crystal growth going. Uh, you also have a lot of uh, impurities or uh, vacancies and so on if you don't hit the right uh, conditions, but then you also get a very different uh, band offset. So the point is here that um, what we have realized with the STM that it really small details that make a big difference on the electronic properties and how the band alignment are between the semiconductor and supercontractor. Um, here's an example of uh, Again, the same uh, device, uh, this is typically the dimensions of the devices we are working with, 100 nanometers. Uh, in this case, we have a single atomic step on surface. Um, but again, uh, even under these uh, conditions where we really have uh, put a lot of effort in cleaning up the surface, we still see some small uh, irregularities or defects. Uh, in this case, is a cluster of atoms, two atoms sitting on top here. So there's still room for improvement. Um, here's another example where we have clusters of atoms here. This is a vacancy in the crystal. And here's an zoom in where you can see uh, uh, the, the unit surface unit cell of this two by two uh, surface reconstructed surface. <clears throat> another point I want to uh, bring up here is that if you make a scan, um, along an add atom sitting on the surface. Um, then we see that uh, the confined bulk states, uh, the, the subbands uh, living in this uh, accumulation um, region close to the interface, uh, to the surface in this case, uh, seems unaffected when you go above. So you tunnel uh, through this region and into the tunnel band, uh, into the conduction band. But a lot of things happen with the surface states we have in the gap. So you see some pretty consistent surface states appearing here, but once you go above, then the surface states are, are destroyed. Um, so at least on this length scale, it seems like um, what is going on the, on the surface is uh, not affected uh, with this resolution uh, in, the, uh, in the bulk bands. Same with uh, when you have an island vacancy uh, as well. Um, but it's important to also note that when we go across the wafer on longer length scales, then it's 
then it's not like everything is uh, uh, is uh, constant and constant energy. We can see the small variations. This is already, uh, uh, this is the band offset, uh, and then you have the confined uh, subbands here, and you know, there are small variations across. And uh, typically, uh, this is some surface states here. Uh, this is uh, maybe just to make it clear. This is a uh, for a given scan like this, where you map out where you don't have uh, any uh, surface disorder, and then you locate your surface states inside the map here. And you're pretty consistent across the wafer. You have uh, for this surface reconstruction, you have some surface states living, fortunately, uh, uh, far away from from those subbands. In this case. Um, but what I want to say is that uh, there is variations across, and especially when we see atomic step on the surface, uh, there's the tendency to see a change in potential on the surface. And this is pretty, was very surprising uh, that a step in the surface um, made a difference. Okay, um, to move on, uh, Across the drawback with STM is it really difficult to get information from the buried interface between the superconductor and semiconductor. So we uh, went into ARPAS, uh, which uh, can probe deeper into the uh, bands of the buried interfaces. Uh, this is at PSI. There's an address beamline um, that is very suitable for these materials. And then we uh, bolted on an aluminum source in season and a shutter. So we could uh, characterize um, the band structure of indium arsenide and also as we grow uh, the superconductor on top in season and see how the bands of the indium arsenide change. Um, yes. Um, <clears throat> the drawback of course with Arbus is that uh, you don't have spatial resolution. You uh, map uh, on millimeter scale uh, devices, so it's really an average you get. Um, <clears throat> but uh, nevertheless, you can really see very clear uh, band structures, of course. And uh, we have developed in this paper on archive, we developed a, a method to extract uh, the band profile. First, you need uh, of very interfaces. First, you can measure directly on the semiconductor, uh, which is uh, easy. You can even see the confined pulse stage appearing here. This is a zoom in here. You can see two states. Um, the venous band is always more visible. And then you can uh, uh, you can also measure core levels at the same time, and because the potential and the distance between the conduction band and valence band and the core levels uh, is assumed to be a constant uh, property. Then uh, if we measure the distance to the core levels, then we can uh, also measure with the aluminum on top and, um, and probe much deeper by just lo looking at core levels. Um, and the reason why we just want to look at the core levels is because they, the mean free path uh, and the resolution in uh, from the core levels is much higher. And also because the core levels are more localized, then we can um, get much uh, cleaner uh, mapping of the core levels uh, than at uh, the levels around the frame level uh, of the conduction band and valence band. Um, so what we have found is that uh, generally uh, when you put aluminum on, you tend to bend more than on the bare surfaces. But this is really uh, just a, a very rough first uh, measurement because there's so many details we also find out that uh, matters uh, similar to what we found with the STM. Uh, one thing is that when you just put on uh, aluminum in CISO, uh, we can see that uh, we don't see any aluminum bands appearing. You just see like a lot of uh, uh, electrons filling up to the uh, to the Fermi level, 
without any dispersion. And this is uh, probably because maybe the crystal quality put on at this very low temperature is, uh, is not very good. Um, but you see it uh, generally also when we grow thicker aluminum layers, in this case, uh, indium antimony, uh, with a 2.5 nanometers, it really gets uh, uh, difficult to look at because you don't have any uh, bonds in here. A general thing is that indium antimony doesn't, uh, that, that's something independent almost of, uh, well, something we can say very generally and not a material fabrication uh, uh, detailed uh, is that uh, you pin in the conduction band of indium arsenide and you pin around uh, around, the, around the conduction band edge with indium antimonide. Uh, so there's really not, uh, so with indium antimonide, you really have to be careful just to make it sure that you have bands living close to the semiconductor bands living close to your superconductor. Um, if you look at the intermass and aluminum uh, case here, uh, this is uh, why we have tried on different crystal orientations and all the different fabrication uh, methods. Um, sorry, uh, I can see my time is running extremely fast. Uh, so I will think I will skip uh, through um, these uh, these presentations, uh, but say that uh, the difference between these different band alignment profiles is simply fabrication details. And the same with uh, indium and timonite, you also have some differences in how you cleaned it, uh, how you cleaned it up, if you have aluminum or not, but it typically lies uh, light, uh, it's almost gapped. Uh, in the semiconductor. Um, the orientations of the crystals of aluminum uh, matters a lot uh, and how it grows. Uh, uh, I will skip the details here, but this is really about uh, important epitaxy uh, and how you're growing it. Because if you manage to grow a very nice uniform epitaxial layer, with uh, only two, the two degenerate bicrystal orientations on top. Um, then we see in others that uh, these bands start to appear. We don't see the, uh, the confined, uh, the quantum well states as we would expect. Uh, it really looks like bulk bands, but the bottom of the band is higher up than what we expect from a bulk material. But that's really only what we see here. Um, if you take a cut through the Fermi level, um, you can see the bands uh, uh, with the uh, beryllium zones uh, across uh, here. And I will skip this one because I'm really surprised that the time was uh, running so fast. Um, uh, an important point I want to bring up here is that because we have these bulk bands and they don't seem to uh, uh, overlap if you just look at one beryllium zone, as we typically do. Typically, we just look at one beryllium zone uh, after the Indian and see where the aluminum bands are. Um, but here, when we go down to the uh, valence band of Indian we can see the bands of uh, uh, the aluminum. And um, if we really want to map the, the full band structure of this hybrid two to three ratio, uh, lattice plane ratio of intermass and aluminum. Uh, it's the reverse in the beryllium zone. Is, uh, had need, you need three beryllium zones and two beryllium zones of intermass and to see the full picture. So this is kind of uh, the typical band we see, but uh, what we should uh, be careful in saying uh, when we don't have any overlap at all, uh, we could look at uh, the hybrid beryllium zone where you have uh, three beryllium zones of intermass and two of aluminum. And then you can see a lot of uh, well uh, across the spectrum. Okay, uh, we, can, we have also seen it with lead. Uh, sorry, how many uh, minutes should we uh, set aside for, uh, questions. for uh, <coughs> questions? 
I think, um, say, five to six minutes would be nice for questions. Okay. Um, we have also measured on lead, and uh, lead grows uh, uh, more easily on the uh, one-on-one -one surfaces, more easily to get the, the band structure out of lead, but we still haven't seen a really uh, well-defined quantum well states. Uh, we do see well-defined quantum well states if you grow on silicon one-on-one -on -one, uh, with lead, but uh, so until now we haven't seen it on, on the engine mass night here. But we do see some uh, some some band lines that's not uh, we we cannot explain yet. Interesting thing with this particular uh, material is that we uh, had a small band offset and only one uh, sub band uh, appearing in the engine mass nine. Okay, then I'll just uh, think I will finish with uh, just highlighting this work uh, previous uh, because there are not as many people working on VLS wires. Uh, uh, this was about making uh, shadow junctions. Uh, of course, the junctions are extremely important for many things, uh, uh, not only to to probe uh, into the nanowire with, uh, without uh, having to look at a lot of other states. Uh, but also uh, for technologies, uh, uh, it's good to have less dissipations, of course, in junctions. Whoops. Um, we are following. Uh, uh, we followed the work from uh, from these uh, 2007 papers on shadow in situ shadow junctions where I use nanowires uh, as shadows. Um, the good thing here is that. Um, there's uh, pros and cons with the different difference, uh, different approaches, but I really think we have found a, a good approach which only take the cons, uh, the pros into account here. Um, it's, a, it's a one step uh, MPE fabrication growth uh, where you grow the semiconductor, you grow the superconductor and have the shadow junctions in one step and it's really efficient. So you, once you have uh, made the pre-growth fab, you can grow these different type of nanowires um, and put different type of missiles on and it's very, um, uh, the junctions uh, perform in a very well, nice uh, nice way. So this is really uh, common by my uh, nanowires, I use my nanowires uh, talk because I'm limited. Uh, but there's a, in this case here, you can see there's a lot of, uh, flexibility in making uh, advanced uh, structures with sharp junctions. And as this paper uh, emphasized, it's really important to have sharp junctions, uh, shadow junctions in order to have a, a concised and, and transparent uh, transport through the junctions. Um, yeah, as also stated here, I think uh, that's where I would need to stop. <laughs> So that's a uh, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you for, for this nice talk, Peter. And uh, so then the rule would be to, if everybody, if anyone wants to ask a question, then raise your hand and I will unmute you. And if you don't have time for your question, then please uh, ask your question via either private or public chat. So it also means that I will ask the speakers not to leave immediately after their talk. <clears throat> yeah. So then, uh, if you have any questions, uh, raise your hand, please. And I'm just uh, going through the... And let me see how this works. So you should be able to, yeah should be able to raise your hand. Yeah, perhaps you should explain a little bit how to raise the hand. No? Okay, well, uh, I, I figured that by now everybody is profic as proficient as Zoom as I had to be in the last uh, half a year. So then in the chat window, when you open your participant list, you should be able to, you, you have a button that says uh, raise hand on the right hand side of the main window. Uh, but if it doesn't work, then you can also ask the question via chat. So 
or you can raise your hand via chat and I will unmute you in that case as well. <clears throat> of course, we can, uh, you're very welcome to contact me or... Uh, and, the, and of the course, indeed, so then uh, further contact afterwards, that would also, uh, also an option, would also be an option. Uh, let me see. Attila? Uh, yes, Alfredo. Uh, we, we are, as uh, organizers, we don't have the option to raise a hand, so I can ask a question directly. Yeah, exactly, then, then please go ahead. Um, hello, Peter, thank you for the talk. Um, it's a question, when you say that the ban offset uh, can vary a lot yeah. from wafer to wafer, you give a estimate of uh, 0.3 EV to 0.2 EV. Uh, so is this 0.2 EV like uh, the minimal or can can vary even further? Yeah, it can, it can vary even further actually. Uh, it can vary uh, all the way from uh, we have what we have seen in the, when we have passive with hydrogen, for example, uh, it has a huge effect and it made uh, make the band offset much more. Uh, so it's more closer to 0 0.1. We have also seen in MB grown samples um, that you can get all the way down to 0 0.6 EV. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a huge span. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you, Peter. Um, let me ask a follow-up on, on this actually. So you, you mentioned that this exact band structure actually depends on the aluminum layer thickness quite a lot. So what happens if you average out for, for an inhomogeneous layer thickness? Just mention this very briefly. Yeah, it, it seems like uh, we need a homogeneous um, layer and a single type of uh, crystal structure. So you, um, before we see the bands of aluminum, um, even if you have a flat, uh, thin layer of aluminum, it's not always we see it. It, it seems like it needs to align uh, with the semiconductor in a well-defined way. Of course, if it's, uh, you can imagine if it's slightly misorientated, uh, then it's also difficult to, to probe it in the office, of course, at the same time as the indium mass night. I see. Uh, th there is a question in chat that... Uh, uh, which combination of material you would suggest. And in the meantime, we are checking the possibility of raising your hands. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so uh, it depends really, of course, on a, uh, on many things. Uh, I think uh, if, um, what is the intriguing with uh, indium antimony, for example, is of course you have a large liver separation and, and large speed normal coupling. Uh, because it's so the band alignment is so close to the conduction band edge, it's, uh, it's really uh, difficult to, uh, to engineer a certain type of band structure that you go in and have one sub band, for example, uh, as what we have experienced at least. Um, there's some, uh, this is of course only in the language of band alignment. Um, I, I would say, uh, uh, I, I cannot answer that question. <laughs> I, I would because it's uh, there's uh, there's too many pros and cons with the different uh, type of materials. Um, I do think uh, um, uh, indium antimony lead uh, with shadow junctions is an interesting material um, because of the uh, because of the high uh, spin orbit uh, coupling and high uh, fields uh, you can go to very high fields and, and uh, yeah. So maybe I would uh, say uh, if, for exploration of these materials I've shown here, I would say uh, indium antimony lead would be an interesting system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. So then uh, before we move on to Francesco's talk, so let me just mention, okay, this was not explained properly, sorry about that. So you have to go to the participant list and then under the names you have the option to raise your hand. So this knowledge you will be able to use for the next talk, which will be given by Francesco. So then uh, let us just uh, switch 
sharing screens and and let us thank uh, Peter for his nice talk again. So just back to you. And Peter, please unshare your screen so then uh, we can move on to Francesco. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to find out how to do it. Stop share. Stop sharing, yes. And also, yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> Okay, good morning, everybody. I will share. I cannot share my screen yet. Uh, Ramon, can, can you please yeah. let him do so? Yeah, now it works. Um, And you should see the wall screen, the full screen, right? Indeed, we see that. So yeah, this okay. talk is going to be about headless semiconducting, superconducting nonwire devices given by Francesco Borsai from QTech Delft. So looking forward to it. And this talk is going to be 20 minutes in total with questions. And I will give a thumbs up when your time is running up. Yeah, thanks, Attila, and thanks to all uh, the organizing. I'm uh, Francesco Borsoi, and I'm from Delft. I am finishing my PhD in Delft. And today I wanted to update you on the progress that we are making in the creation of uh, fabless devices, where fabless means essentially uh, removing all the assholes of fabrication. This is more or less like a dream to create a device, a complex device without uh, a lot of fabrication. And um, in the audience, we probably have our, man, everybody is kind of familiar with the Majoranas, but um, which is essentially the goal of our investigation. But I will still want to give uh, a brief overview of why we are doing what we are doing. And essentially, the story starts with uh, the first observation of a zero, zero bias peak where um, at the interface of, uh, at the interface of uh, an inhuman timonid and uh, niobentine nitride. This was detected by tunneling spectroscopy at uh, the end of his nanowire, where the fact that the nanowire was proximitized with uh, niobentine nitride gives uh, the characteristic fingerprint of a soft gap. Um, this problem was actually solved by Peter with um, is uh, um, a, the engineering of uh, epitaxial uh, interfaces between a semiconductor and a superconductor, which allowed uh, the observation of a 2E charging effect of uh, on uh, inhuman arsenide aluminum nanowires, and then also inhuman timonide aluminum nanowires. Of course, the goal of a community is to create the first topological qubit, and several architectures have been uh, put forward. However, there, I believe there are still two key questions to address um, before that. And the first of all is determining determine how big is the topological gap that protects the qubit. And second, how to measure this information, which is um, encoded in the parity of Majoranus. And the first one requires the fabrication of uh, free terminal devices. And the second requires uh, possibly um, the formation of uh, nano networks or at least complex single nanowire structure. And exploring this concept essentially experimentally requires reliable fabrication methods that can produce this device fast and with reproducible properties. And we should envision these methods in a way that can lead to, for instance, three terminal devices or even a primitive qubit in a very straightforward way. And this is what uh, I want to talk about today. Um, as Peter addressed in the first talk, it's really difficult to combine a semiconductor to a superconductor. In our lab, we decided to go for inhuman timonite nanowires. The reason is that we can uh, have this nanowire extremely long with um, a technology introduced by the Eindhoven team uh, in 2019. We can have, in fact, nanowires 
with length up to 10 micrometer long and um, we can benefit from the high absolute value of a G factor. And we like to couple with uh, aluminum. Aluminum has been widely used in the last year due to the fact that by engineering film, films of aluminum, we can achieve uh, uh, induced gap in the nanowires up to few tesla. The problem is that the combination of an inhuman antimonide and aluminum is extremely fragile. Not only for the fact that the band alignment can vary, but this is something that we don't know when we make a device. But because that when, when you create the interface between indium antimonide and aluminum, this is actually very unstable and prone to degradation with time and with temperature. This means that uh, we cannot perform uh, complicated uh, fabrication uh, procedures in the clear room at uh, temperature above the room temperature. And this is really creating um, a slowdown in the fabrication of devices. The second problem is that if a wire is covered with aluminum, it's hard to create a junction because etching the aluminum uh, is not a recipe which has been stabilized and the etching contaminates and damages the crystalline, uh, the, the wire crystal. Thirdly, all this limitation creates uh, um, impede to go uh, forward to to create complex nanowires devices. And, uh, and to, see, to circumvent these issues in Delft, we decided to go for a different route. In fact, we wanted to go for a method where we avoided to etch the aluminum from the nanowire, solving issue number two, where we could look, uh, um, where we could try to avoid uh, the fabrication runs after the synthesis of the interface in human antimonide aluminum, solving issues number one, let's say, and where the fact that we have to clean the surface of in human antimonide before deposit aluminum does not create um, an obstacle to complexity. And with this in mind, we developed uh, the so-called shadow bullitography technique which was uh, recently out in an archive uh, in July. And the idea is that um, in our chip, we prepare all the difficult part essentially. We engineer all the um, difficult components of a cir circuit before creating the interface of inhuman timonide and aluminum. Um, the idea is that we start from chips which are prefabricated with um, bottom gates, bond paths, and shadow walls. Um, shadow walls are nothing else than uh, dielectric pillar, which have uh, a very clever um, geometry, and which allows to cast shadows all across the circuit and not only on the nanowire. After creating this, um, uh, this kind of substrate, um, and the creation of this substrate is actually quite scalable, we can make a uh, hundred of them. Um, we transferred the nanowires, which you see in green, above the bottom gates and next to these uh, shadow walls. And the idea is that we can deposit at least uh, very easily 10 nanowires in these places on a chip, and then we load our chip in the load lock of our evaporator. In the load lock, we can uh, perform an atomic hydrogen cleaning to remove a native oxide around in human human, actually specifically in three facets of in human human and then deposit uh, aluminum or another metal or another superconductor at 30 degrees. Uh, 30 degrees is an important angle because allows to um, create a free facet coverage onto the nanowire and at the same time a uh, lead which connects to this. And this is really important when it comes to realizing, for instance, three terminal device for the exploration of a topological gap. And when after this process, the device now looks like this. So we come with a shadow angle aluminum deposition from the top right, which creates three contacts. But of course, when, um, when it comes to create this uh, uh, fabrication flow, we have to go step for step by step. And the first simpler device that we prepare um, were a shadow wall Joseph junction based on uh, the same concept, but on, but on similar, um, but on different uh, shadow wall geometry, which you now see in purple. Now, if we take uh, a lamella cut on the nanowire, 
indeed you see what I said before. So the nanowire is covered with a free facet. Um, it's the aluminum, the new antimony is covered on free facet by an aluminum layer, which connects to the floor creating a lid. And crucially, ADX reveals basically no oxygen at the interface between aluminum and aluminum. And aluminum. Um, when we use a bottom gate on the below, below the device and we apply a positive gate voltage, we can detect uh, um, a relatively high supercurrent, which goes from an order of 80 nanoampere to zero at 1.9 Kelvin. In fact, 1.9 Kelvin is a typical uh, um, transition uh, superconducting critical temperature for this thin aluminum layer. Where here in this case, the aluminum maximum thickness is on the order of uh, uh, 14, 15 nanometer. Uh, but when it comes to Majorana, uh, um, when it comes to Majorana, we want to create a normal superconducting junction. And to do so, we had in the first case to introduce uh, an additional lead. This additional lead, which is now made by titanium and gold, has been, uh, is, has been added in a second fabrication step. Um, so we go to the clear, we pattern the, the lead, deposit titanium gold, and we then load the sample into the fridge. And it is important uh, uh, also when it comes to looking for Majorana that uh, the transport is as clean. Um, ideally, we don't want to have uh, too many quantum dot resonances. And in fact, this is what uh, you see on the top right uh, image where we scan the bias versus tunnel gate and we go at low transparency from a hard induced gap to an announcement of a conductance. And this transition indicates really a ballistic, uh, a ballistic type of transport at the interface. But as I said, we really want to um, avoid uh, the fabrication after creating the interface between aluminum and inium and antimony. So the question is, can we avoid at all this post fabrication? Can we engineer somehow the fabrication of uh, this extra lead inside the same chamber in situ? And the answer is actually yes. And this led to an additional work, which is uh, coming out uh, soon. Um, the device that uh, I have in mind now is uh, illustrated in this figure. So I'm speaking about uh, an asymmetric Chodefron junction where the asymmetry is given by the different thickness of aluminum. Um, what it means is that uh, we can create in the single uh, fabrication run both a thin aluminum uh, layer where we will then look for Majorana modes at, located uh, where you see the star and create as well these two leads made out of thick aluminum. Now, probably you will remember that uh, um, the induced gap and the critical magnetic field will decrease when making uh, the aluminum thicker. Um, therefore, we will use indeed the asymmetry of the thickness as an interesting tool to change the device by using temperature and magnetic field. The way we do this is actually by doing a two angle deposition step. First, we deposit a thin layer at 50 degrees with respect to the surface, where at the position of both uh, the square and the triangle, the aluminum essentially lands. And secondly, we go for a thinner, for a, sorry, for a smaller angle at 30 degrees and covering uh, only the lid with a um, thicker layer of let's say 30 nanometer. Um, so a real device looks like this. Uh, we have a source and drain, we have um, an asymmetric Josephson junction, and a series of bottom gates below. Now, when I, by tuning the magnetic field, we see the transition from uh, asymmetric Josephson junction, a zero magnetic field, where the two gaps are slightly different, to a INS type of, type of device at uh, 0 0.4 Tesla. And so we actually have a, a very large uh, magnetic field range in which to perform tunneling spectroscopy. So when it comes to searching for Majorana, what we can do is change the value of a super gate and see how the subgap states enter in the game. 
So this is at a very negative supergate voltage. So at minus 1.75 volt, where the density in the wire is actually very low. So we probably don't have any bands confined. And upon increasing the supergate voltage at 0.2 volt, here we see the first state coming down, reaching the value of a quantized, um, reaching the quantized value at around 1.7 volt, 1.7 Tesla. Um, here is actually very complicated to distinguish between an Andrew state or a Majorana state. This is, I think is the point of this conference. It's actually very difficult to do. But I can say that uh, this state is actually not living for a long, for a large gate space in um, super gate and tunnel gate. So personally, I don't believe this has, this is speaking as a Majorana mode. But let's increase further the super gate. And what it happens is that now we start to populate a larger number of bands in the nanowire. And as a consequence, we see a larger number of states coming down. And this is at 0 0.5 volt and slightly larger at 0 0.7 volt. So upon increasing the supergate voltage, we are renormalizing the G factor and, the, uh, and the, probably the induced gap at low field, which is something that you can already see. So I hope um, this is uh, this transfer. These transfer features are clear to all you. Otherwise, we have a question. We will have a question. So let me conclude. Um, what we did in Delft is develop a new approach uh, called the shadow wall lithography of hybrid quantum device. The idea is that we can use shadow wall and deposi shadow deposition to eliminate most of the fabrication process after the delicate in U1 T1 aluminum interface. And that by engineering a double angle deposition step, we can actually eliminate at all the need for uh, X C2 uh, or post fabrication steps, such as the creation of a normal lead. And uh, this technology actually leads to free terminal device that can be used uh, to look for the topological gap in nanowire devices but also it allows the formation of uh, a primitive qubit, which is the so-called loop qubit, with, um, with predefined properties. So we can easily tune the length of the junction. Um, the length also of the Majorana segments in the, previous, uh, in the previous slides can be easily tuned by adjusting the smart oil um, length by the lithography. So with this, I want to conclude and uh, thanks to the organizers of this uh, conference, but also to my own col my collaborators in Delft at Microsoft and in Eindhoven and also in uh, Poland. So thanks very much and my talk is finished. Yes, thank you Francesco for this uh, nice talk and uh, now the session is open for questions. And Shunkum Park has a question, so let me just uh, try to. Uh, I ask him to unmute. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, my question is that uh, uh, can you uh, measure some? Uh, uh, induced gap as a function of the thickness uh, of the, uh, the aluminum? Um, this is something uh, that we did not do, but for instance, in um, you still see my talk, right? I mean, going down. Yes. Uh, so let's go, for instance, at this slide. Uh, if you look at the data at uh, zero Tesla, you see that um, so we are looking at an asymmetric Josephson junction. And in this kind of case of devices, you have um, a multiple and reflection pattern, which actually derives from the uh, both gaps. So we have the delta one plus delta two peak at let's say 0 0.5 uh, millivolt. But also then we can distinguish both gap. Um, one is typically 250 micro electron volt and the other one is typically 200. So this is already uh -huh. gives you an idea on how the thickness changes the gap. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for your question. Okay, so in the interest of time, we have to move on, but if you have further questions to Francesco, feel free to ask via chat or contact him later on. 
Okay, so then thank you, Francesco, again. Thank and you. Let's move to Damon's talk. I will stop. Yeah, you will stop sharing, and Damon can start sharing, which will be about uh, shadow epitaxy of indium in, in situ growth of generic semiconductor superconductor hybrids given by Ramon, uh, Ramon Karat uh, from QDF Copenhagen. Oops. Yeah, one sec. I just need to go full screen first. I think is the idea. And then now if I share, it should come up. Okay. You see the presentation in full screen? Or? Yes. Uh, not yet. It's not in full screen. So. No, yet. No. Now. But now it's okay. in full screen. Thank, thank you, Dan. So okay, looking great. forward to it. Lord cool. Um, so, yeah, I'm uh, going to talk about a, a quite similar to the impressive uh, structures from Delft, but in a little different mode because, uh, uh, yeah, I guess I can skip this kind of motivation slide. We want to get hard gap perfect, the uh, crystalline, uh, high quality hybrid devices. Um, and we also want to avoid the kind of damage that uh, etching can do. So this is just an example of even on the same chip with different nanowires, you get different edge results and uh, bad etching, damaged indium arsenide, all, all kinds of possible things. And the other motivation that we had, which hasn't, which uh, Peter touched on briefly, was that uh, the original concept behind the indium arsenide aluminium epitaxy, if you look at that paper name, it doesn't mention in the arsenide or, uh, or aluminium, it says semiconductor superconductor epitaxy. Um, and the uh, motivation was to do this in a more general way, like instead of limiting ourselves to just a couple of materials, as Peter says, there's a whole zoo of materials. You can look at the periodic table and see a whole zoo of materials that you could try. And, and uh, the big advantage to doing that is that aluminium actually has a relatively low critical temperature and critical field and superconducting gap. So uh, important motivation for applications for being able to better preserve the, um, the hybrid balance states that you generate in your gap, you would like a bigger gap, you would like to go to higher operating temperatures, uh, and of course you would also like to go to higher critical fields so it might motivate you to use some of these other materials. So the way that we're doing it is again, similar to Peter uh, with the, using an entirely in situ process. So the devices will uh, not see oxygen until the uh, superconductor semiconductor interface is made. Um, and for that, of course, we need to use some shadowing technique to make functional devices um, and as Francesco briefly touched on, just using nanowire shadows isn't very, uh, uh, you can't make many different kinds of devices with that and you want to be able to make these loop qubits, you want to be able to make NS junctions and Josephson junctions. So our kind of answer to that was to make growth substrates with a shadow mask built in. So what you can see here is in uh, black down at the bottom. This is actually a cross section where I uh, split the wafer in half essentially. And so we could see a cross section in an SEM of the, the structure of the wafer. So down the bottom is this indium arsenide, but in the blue is uh, silicon dioxide. And the nanowires are growing in these trenches that have formed and the silicon dioxide uh, We've, we've left some ridges that hang across the trenches so that if you deposit the metal at an angle of uh, 10 degrees to 30 degrees, you will get uh, shadows forming on the nanowires, something like this. So you deposit the superconductor or whatever metal from an angle and you can make Josephson junctions because there's a shadowing. Um, uh, and so this is what it looks like in real life. Uh, so this works and the main advantage of this, as I said, is that you can make all kinds of different devices. So if you want an NS device, you simply use a very wide bridge to shadow the entire lower bottom half of the nanowire. You can make 
uh, island devices by having two bridges, and you can make uh, the setup for a loop qubit by having these two, uh, uh, three bridges to make two different islands. And you could go to infinite bridges. <laughs> Um, and again, it's uh, completely scalable across the entire wafer. So on a single growth run, we can get all of the different kinds of devices. So we usually have different sections here. Maybe this top half is for NS, then we have some Josephson junctions, some islands, double islands. And uh, the other advantage to using the uh, in-situ growth without taking it out and moving analyze around before that is that you can get some more elaborate structures and start thinking about some more elaborate future applications, for instance, by having these full shell nanowires where now this nanowire is sitting in a, symmet a spherically symmetrical um, configuration where you deposit six times around the nanowire to coincide with the six facets that the nanowire has and then you form these pattern full shell wires. And this is kind of important for uh, uh, <clears throat> some talks, I think tomorrow about uh, the possibility to use uh, the flux uh, to generate Majorana modes and other interesting physics. Um, and again, if you want to make different kinds of devices, you just change the number of bridges or their dimensions. Um, and there's still more possibilities to go into in situ devices. If you want to protect that interface, you could deposit an insulator, for instance, in green. So after your first metallic yellow deposition, you could do a fully conformal deposition to protect it in situ, or to also do a kind of fabless device, as Francesco talked about. You could do a double angle evaporation um, around a single bridge so that you would have uh, the yellow superconductor and the, the orange metal kind of meeting in here to give you this uh, S uh, nanowire normal metal junction fully in situ. Um, yeah. So to go on to the devices um, and how they operate, um, uh, so this kind of device is used to investigate the uh, spectroscopy of a hybrid system. And similarly, uh, and yeah, so similarly to Fran uh, Francesco, we have these uh, uh, states uh, associated with the aluminium uh, gap, superconducting gap, and some subband states, which in this case are, of course, some kind of Andreev uh, states at zero field. And if you fix your gate voltage, um, and increase the parallel magnetic field, then they can converge and come into some kind of zero bias peak of some origin. Um, so this it shows that our kind of uh, our technique works well with aluminium, the kind of state of the art material by now. But perhaps the more interesting thing to do is to start to explore other materials and also to start to look for the reproducibility. So a big, uh, a big point of doing these fabulous or limiting or fab, uh, less fabrication techniques is to try and get some reproducibility into the uh, into these devices. Um, so on this, and it's a little bit colloquial, but it's I think it's still a good sign that uh, on this one this ship of aluminium devices that I fabricated, I just made five devices, and all five of them worked, and all five of them showed a hard superconducting gap. And this is actually not something that we can typically say for devices that have seen etching. Um, so similarly, and then we can, so that's already a good sign. And of course, the other new thing was to try new materials, so try and tantalum. Now, again, I made five tantalum devices. Five of them worked. Uh, four of them had a hard gap. Weirdly, one of them didn't. So perhaps this is due to some resist being left on the surface or something weird with this device. Um, but nevertheless, this is also an interesting point to make that materials other than aluminium can have <laughs> nice superconducting properties and are worth investigating, um, particularly because tantalum has a much, much increased uh, critical magnetic field compared to aluminium. Um, and the interesting thing about aluminium also was uh, about tantalum, sorry, 
also was that it happened to be amorphous for at least nanocrystalline. So this is looking at some uh, uh, TEM, transmission electron isoprosopy. And you see the classic, uh, right now a classic crystalline aluminium on crystalline indium arsenide. And this wasn't the case for tantalum, which is, uh, shows an interesting thing that you can actually get high gaps without necessarily having to have crystalline crystals, which is interesting. Um, so we also tried niobium, um, which uh, in this particular device formed an ice QPC without any quantum dot states. So if you take a line traces in gate at zero bias and at finite bias, you get the two traces here, where at, uh, at uh, finite bias, uh, sorry, at zero bias, you get conductance doubling on the steps and, and outside the gap, you get the uh, classic uh, quantized conductance traces. But what we found with niobium was something that actually turns out to be fairly common, is that uh, what we suppose is oxide formation on the surface of the niobium. So not at the interface, the interface is still pristine, but on the surface of the niobium, you get oxide formation, which is actually reasonably well known from the literature that will soften your gap. So the idea would be to, uh, that we could use some capping here in the future. Um, so moving on to the more complex structures, eventually these kind of circuits in a, in a ideal uh, futuristic topological quantum computer is going to be made out of some kind of uh, devices like this, which uh, known as my Rana Islands. Essentially they're a superconducting, semiconducting hybrid quantum dot. So this section in purple should just add for the dis uh, act for the discrete addition of Cooper pairs at zero field um, by tuning VG. Uh, so if we look at the electronic characteristics, this is kind of what we see. We see a series of diamonds, of Coulomb diamonds, where the spacing between um, the Coulomb peaks at zero bias in gate voltage is in uh, proportional to two electrons. So this is adding Cooper pairs. And a finite bias above the gap, this reverts to 1E single electron charging. And also, if you look at the temperature dependence, you can see this where at zero temperature you're adding in terms of Cooper pairs, and at increased temperature, uh, uh, you end up adding uh, single electrons again due to quasi particle poisoning. Um, but the most interesting thing to do is to apply a parallel field. Um, which can also cause single electron tunneling, but this is mostly due to some kind of bound state uh, falling below the level of the superconducting gap. So where the spectrum here splits into two at kind of 0.2 Tesla, uh, this is due to an Andreev state or some other kind of bound state coming below that gap. Uh, and this may be due to either a trivial state or a topological state, depend, depending on various factors. Um, and so these kind of experiments have been done before, but what was strongly limiting in the past was the fact that you could kind of do an experiment like this and say, okay, well, maybe it's a, maybe it's a certain kind of state and then move to a different gate voltage configuration and change your device around a little bit and see different kinds of states, but perhaps you wouldn't actually be able to come back to your original uh, gate configuration because uncontrolled charge switching would completely change the picture and you wouldn't be able to recover your original state. This is probably due to etching causing damage or other kinds of things. So now that we have these cleaner devices, we can actually go over a much, much wider gate range. Um, and so it just keeps going and going and going and going. And as we scroll through, you can see all sorts of different behaviors in terms of peak spacing and peak heights as, uh, uh, as it goes from the Cooper pair charging to the single electron charging. Um, so it's uh, very hard to present a single measurement in an <laughs> easily visible way. Um, but yeah, essentially now we can start to see with, with the fact that we have, instead of 
having 20 or 30 charge states now out to 364 uh, individual charge states without any hysteresis or major switching events in our device. Now we can start to look at all sorts of different um, uh, features without risking having our devices to switch. So for instance, just pulling some examples from the data here, you can see that the peak spacing remains fairly equal, whereas here the peak spacing, just as it goes from 2E to 1E, there is a difference here, uh, like this spacing is bigger than that spacing, this spacing is in that spacing, so it's kind of even odd that may be a signature of a Majorana. Uh, and, uh, and actually the parity of the device can completely switch. So here you're actually adding an uh, odd number of electrons to the dot. So you're adding even number of electrons only here, you're only adding odd number of electrons. So this has all kind of been seen before, but the advantage now is that if you imagine trying to tune up your topological quantum computer and you have switching, uh, then it's going to be impossible to do that. But now you can do it hysteresis free and you can start to use these kind of AI or machine learning methods that have been developed for quantum dots. Um, I mean, that's kind of what I just said. So, yeah, so that's the kind of summary for our technique so far. We have been able to dramatically increase the stability of devices. We've been able to try some new materials and uh, again, increase the kind of uh, quality of these hybrid superconducting devices. Um, so yeah, I'd like to thank everyone that helped work in this project. It was a nice long, uh, long project that involved a lot of people and uh, yeah, there's some continuing results on that coming up soon as well. Uh, thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you, Damon, for this nice talk. And it's open for questions. And I already see that Sirius slash Hugh has a question. So I just uh, unmute them and. At least I. Yep. Yeah, so so in, uh, in the presentation of Peter Clark's talk, he rapidly mentioned that. Uh, when uh, making junction with a shadow, uh, another wire that is shadowing, it's very important that this other wire is very close to the one you shadow. And here in the structures we have shown, it's quite a big distance between, uh, between the beam and uh, the wire. So is it a problem or wh why should it be different here? Uh, whether that really matters or not depends on the material. Um, so here is electron microscopy with the three different materials. Uh -huh. And uh, so here's an SEM, the close-up TEM. But what we're really interested in for this question is, of course, this medium distance one where you can see this LT, which is like a transition length. Um, and this value turns out to be about 35 nanometers or 50 nanometers or something for aluminium, because it's actually not determined that much by the geometry of the system. It's more determined about uh, by the uh, interface energies and other and other growth aspects um, of the, the the competition between interface energies and surface energies of the two materials. So what we see is a slightly longer transition length for tantalum and niobium, but not that much longer um, because it's actually mainly defined by the material itself. So we have another material that I haven't shown here where it was very much defined by the, the geometry and there again, it was this transition length then became many microns, which is kind of un unworkable. But while you're working with these kind of materials, it's actually not, at least beyond a certain, of course, like if you're right up against the nanowire, then of course you can get smaller than that, but as soon as you're over a critical distance, then it's just, it depends on the material more than the geometry. Oh, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Damon. Um, maybe just very quickly uh, before we move on, um, if I see no further questions from the audience. I saw that the uh, induced gap from tantalum is less than the induced gap from aluminum. Is this understood? Yeah, it's uh, because, uh, so the induced gap of aluminium depends on thickness 
across, and it does for tantalum as well, and actually for most superconductors, many other superconductors. But in tan for aluminium, if it gets thinner, the gap gets bigger. Tantalum goes the other way. If it gets thinner, the gap gets smaller. So I do have a slide somewhere here showing that, I think it's this, yeah. So for bulk tantalum to a 100 nanometers thick, the critical temperature was 2.5 Kelvin. Bulk tantalum, 20 nanometers thick, the critical temperature is actually less than one Kelvin. And so same mm -hmm. when it was deposited on the nanowire. So that's okay. the main reason. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you, Damon, for the nice talk again. And uh, let me let us just move on to Casper, also from Copenhagen. Uh, I'll just uh, ask Casper to unmute. I think I'm not allowed to share yet. <laughs> You should be able, Casper. Should I be able now? Okay. Oh, now it works, yeah. All right. Okay, so then on our material list, the next combination is lead of indium arsenide. So I'm looking forward to this talk. So Casper, the floor is yours. Uh, do you see the mouse actually? This, uh... Uh, yes, yeah, we also yes. see okay. that. Yeah. All right, so uh, yeah, thanks a lot to the organizers for allowing me to present uh, some of our recent work on uh, yeah, hybrid devices, as uh, Attila said, where we try to combine uh, lead on indium arsenide. And as you can see here from uh, these two figures, uh, the structure actually turns out to be very, very nice with this if it's actual interface. And what I will present is some of the very initial uh, measurement on, uh, on different type of devices. Um, and the work has been done with several people. So for instance, uh, uh, Thomas here, he has, Thomas Kearney has been growing the, the wires and this very nice structure and also made a lot of calculations to see which materials should be uh, interesting and turns out lead actually is a really good candidate and the best one for indium arsenide uh, superconductor match. And then a lot of other people doing characterization, transport, fabrication and also here Tim work in Sweden and it's done in the group of uh, Jesper Deingart here in Copenhagen, and also a number of uh, funding here that has been partly uh, involved in this work. So for the motivation, I, I guess it has been a little bit of already. So, but just to say from our point of view, or my point of view, that what we like to study is a different type of uh, subgap states. And in this nice review from Prat uh, Adel, you can see it in terms of Andrea Baum state, but it could be Yushibosina state, Majoranas, or even parafermions are ongoing projects and um, you can realize these uh, yeah, spin, superconducting cup to spin or Andreev qubits, supercondical electronics, or even if you can control here yeah, the quantum dot uh, uh, couple of superconducting simulations. And uh, what I will concentrate on here is uh, on the lower part here where they show different experimental techniques. So it will be on the tunneling spectroscopy. So it's very simple measurements here because it's a new material which we uh, will show is quite uh, promising. But of course, it could be interesting to go to more advanced uh, techniques like uh, Joson spectroscopy and microwave spectroscopy eventually. So this is the type of devices. As I mentioned, it's quite simple. So the tunnel device, as uh, David already showed, actually. And then uh, also the superconducting island here. Uh, so it's a piece of lead on indium arsenide uh, on in the structure here, the lead in red. And what we probe is this uh, hard or soft gap and potentially also soft gap states. But here I will focus on the hard and soft gap uh, for the initial measurement. And for the superconducting island, the idea is to, to see and whether it 
that hybrids can be kind of this 2e to 1e transition if, if it's a zero field can uh, host only uh, you could say two electrons uh, in, in each quantum dot um, um, and also if you apply the magnetic field as David pointed out the it gives an indication whether there's a soft gap state moving towards zero. So I'll show that in a minute. Just to pay a little bit uh, uh, attention to what has been doing uh, going on before and, and linked to the previous talk. So Peter and uh, also Thomas and Jesperson here, they showed this in 2015 that you could make aluminum on Indio last night uh, with a very nice uh, interface here. And they defined this hard gap as uh, you have heard that uh, if you look at the actual hybrid, you get this kind of, a, what can you say, a factor of 100 here. It's, I don't know if it's a, the best definition, but at least we can compare easily different type of uh, structures. So that if you compare the conductance above the gap and inside the gap, it's typically a factor of 100. And in this case, they also compared it to evaporated aluminum where it was not as good. I think uh, at least on other devices, uh, we have also measured that uh, Evaporate aluminum, you can also get a factor of 100, but maybe the, the walls here, you could say, of the gap is not as good. And then uh, Damon showed that there's been a process here in investigating other types of uh, hybrids with tantalum and niobium. So, not as nice a crystal structure as with aluminum, uh, but for tantalum, as he said, you actually also still get this hard gap uh, in this definition of a factor of 100. All right, so also other places uh, in the Froloff group, they have uh, changed a little bit and uh, made the material on uh, the tin and now on inhuman timonite and they see the same, uh, that you can also for that uh, hybrid, you can get this factor of 100, which indicate the hard gap, maybe not as nice uh, with the, the, co the coarse particles here at the gap edge, um, but it's also an interesting uh, system. And then they have an, had another measurement where they also test this island geometry and they could see this very nice transition where you have uh, here source uh, gate voltage versus magnetic field and the peaks are uh, Coulomb, uh, Coulomb peaks and the spacing at zero field is kind of double uh, as if you go to high field and this you can interpret as a 2e to a 1e transition and as Damon also said for aluminum and this indicates a soft gap going towards zero and potentially or it could be a Majorana state. Um, all right, so I also made a small table here with uh, some different superconductors, not all of them, it's not fully complete, but uh, one of the considerations uh, you are thinking about is that uh, what is the parameter space for these hybrids and up to the right side here, I just put up some of the uh, consideration you can think about critical temperature gap springs and whether it's hard or soft and so on critical field um, and if you look at the, the different type of superconductor there's one that has not been studied so much uh, Peter he showed a little bit about it it's a uh, lead oh sorry um, and if you look at the table here you can see it has quite interesting properties in the sense of high uh, high gap strength high critical temperature and also, as I will show, it actually seems like if you make that hybrid, you can get a very high uh, critical field, which is interesting because you might uh, get to new regimes. And it also indicate, uh, we also have measurement indicating that you can make this 2 each and one e transition, um, which makes it promising for topological uh, applications. And then uh, I put this atomic number of the elemental uh, superconductor here to show that it's a very high number for lead, as you know, and this means that the spin orbit coupling is uh, strong. So potentially this could also be different than, for instance, aluminum. Uh, and of course, you also have to consider the semiconductor material. In this case, I only talk about in the last night. Uh, so what has been done before on lead? Maybe I should also give an idea on that. Um, so in, in, uh, in within quantum transport, you have also worked on that on carbon nanotube, for instance, also on graphene and point contact. But here is just an example of that you with uh, carbon nanotube can also see uh, a lit uh, gap if you use this kind of material from the Schoenberger group. Uh, and they deduced uh, around one MeV. 
and they could also uh, observe uh, bound states. So it's not that this is new, that uh, quantum transfer of lead has been done before, but you can see it's a bit, it's capped with indium, so lead is uh, oxidizing quite easy. So you have to be a bit of careful in your processing. And then maybe a more relevant work here from uh, the DeSoto group in Pisa, where they make uh, on an indium arsenide nanowire, make a Josen junction, and they can observe a quite transparent one with the uh, high supercurrents. So uh, it's definitely possible to get nice uh, devices, even if this if you do the X C two fabrication. But probably if you look at this, if you could look at these uh, leads in uh, at GM, you would see that the uh, crystal structure would uh, probably be polycrystalline, and you also have a titanium layer here below. So, what could be interesting is to make um, similar to uh, aluminum to try to make the hybrid uh, in situ in the MBE. And this is what uh, Thomas and others have been doing. Um, so, to the left here, you see uh, indium arsenide nanowire covered with lead on two facets. And you can see up here the, uh, the cross section, so indium arsenide a lead uh, layer, and then it's actually been covered with silicon, but that's not so important for this purpose. And if you take a TEM image, for instance, from uh, in this B direction, you can see that you get a very nice crystal structure and an atomically uh, sharp interface. And also if you uh, calculate this uh, by the modeling, then uh, you can actually get um, that the interface is consistent with what was expected before. So Thomas, you made a, in the, our supplement for this uh, archive paper, there's an extensive consideration uh, about lead. And it turns out that uh, lead actually can form a single crystal all along the nanowire, uh, which is the only material that will do that. Uh, and if we also look in one of the other directions, so here in, in F, then you can see the interface is also very nice here and consistent with the, the calculation they made. And finally, if you look at the two facets here, you can see you have two single crystals and then there's a, like a wedge-shaped crystal combining the, the two. So they have very good control of the, of the growth. Um, so we can also, or they can, you can say, uh, change the material uh, thick, thickness of the superconductor. So if you, you can see if you go from 15 to 60 uh, nanometer here, then for the two first one, the morphology of the lead here, which is in red, is very uh, nice and actually almost atomically sharp. If you, here's a temp image and you can zoom in here and you can look at the interface over here, you can see it's a really clean, clean in, uh, the, the cabin here is very clean, so that's very nice. Uh, while if you make it a bit thicker, the morphology is not as, as good, but it, uh, this can probably be improved by proper tuning uh, according to growers. So this was the uh, growth. Uh, they have made a lot of more uh, studies, but now I will go to the transport here. So we start with this very simple tunneling device. And um, yeah, so one thing is to keep the devices in, uh, in uh, HV to, uh, to keep them safe. This you also do for other nanowires, but the processing because of this lead has to be quite fast, but it turns out that within a day, if you days you can actually still make uh, working devices uh, and one of the interesting part is that uh, the selective agent here for uh, lead is actually water so uh, you don't need any a very aggressive chemical and you can make these self-aligned uh, junctions here uh, which is a tunnel probe and the results are shown here to the right where the conductance versus source drain is uh, given and uh, you can see you develop a gap here in the order of the one Milli electron volt, and it's also hard in this uh, definition in the factor of one bit around that. Um, so, just to show, you can also, uh, uh, of course, heat up the sample and get the, um, the critical temperature around 7 Kelvin. And interestingly, in the magnetic field, uh, the gap actually is present in the hybrid here for very high field, even up to 8.5 Tesla, which makes it interesting for maybe having uh, even more room to study uh, these kind of uh, hybrid devices with uh, larger fields and for other types. Um, and just to show it's not just a single device here. So this is seven devices uh, where the gap has been measured in this kind of tunneling spectroscopy me measurement. And we get a roughly around the same uh, induced gap, or you could say the hybrid gap, uh, around 1.2 
5 MeV. And for some of the devices here uh, at high gate voltage, you can also see indication of, uh, of socket states in, uh, in the wire. Uh, this we have not started so much for this first generation, uh, but this would be uh, something we would look more for in, in future studies. And finally, as I promised, we also have made this uh, island, um, as you see on the left, with a piece of lead here coupled to, uh, to two normal leads. And one example is shown here. So if you make uh, gate voltage trace versus uh, salt strain, you will see uh, Coulomb diamonds. And uh, if you look at low bias, you can see some spacing here, which we assign to 2E, and at high bias above the gap, uh, the spacing is half, which would be this uh, 1E due to a, a single yeah, electron tunneling, you could call it. And what people typically do is they make the magnetic field uh, dependent. And this is what we have done on this uh, graph here. So. If we again look at very low field or zero field, we can see we have a spacing between the Coulomb peaks that are quite large. But if we apply a high field, then uh, we have a spacing that is kind of half the value. So this we will, or you can say this indicates this kind of a 2e to 1e transition. It's of course uh, not as nice as the aluminum devices statement I have shown, but um, still is uh, this indication of a subgap state that moves to zero. Uh, and on the left side, you show the bias spectroscopy and kind of the modeling here where you can see that uh, for low field, we should have a, the odd occupancy state, you could say should be above uh, some, some uh, above the crossing here. So you have the 2E and then when we apply the field, you go to this even odd regime. And then in the end, if the state stays at uh, zero, possibly maybe due to my one physics, it could be, um, it will go to 1E. Um, so I think this is, this measurement indicate that this is also possible for lead and it makes it promising for topological as well as non-topological devices. And with this, I will end. Uh, I'll just uh, briefly sum up that uh, the material property of this hybrid is very, uh, actually very nice uh, and it turns out that this combination led on indium arsenide. This is the only uh, combination where you can have a single uh, crystal, at least for uh, uh, elemental superconductors. Um, and for the transport, we just showed very basic initial uh, measurement on this type of hybrid. So, and we have shown that there's a hard gap, which is quite nice, and also uh, indications of a 2E to 1E uh, transition in these devices. And finally, uh, to make a little bit of outlook, so uh, as I mentioned in the table, the, the parameter space with this type is actually much uh, larger. So the critical field is larger, delta uh, gap is larger, and CC, and so on. And also the spin orbit coupling, we didn't study, for, uh, study that here, but it would be nice in the future to see if uh, lead uh, could induce the spin orbit coupling and compare to if it was a evaporated lead here, it's a single crystal. So it actually uh, seems more probable that you can induce a well-defined spin orbit coupling from the lead. And finally, also we can transfer this technique probably to other uh, platforms, uh, SAC and 2D uh, would be very interesting. And then I will mention in the end that uh, lead is actually also a strong coupling superconductor. So the two delta over uh, TC is uh, not the usual BCX fact, BCS factor 3.5. I don't know if, if anyone have an experiment where it could be interesting. And also it's a two band superconductor. So uh, if anyone has uh, ideas for that, that would be very nice. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you Kasper for the nice talk. Uh, maybe we have time for one question in the interest of time. If anyone wants to ask that question, then raise your hand. Uh, otherwise I will do so. So then, uh, so, so what would be the signature of uh, spin orbit coupling in the superconductor in, in transport? Uh, yeah, so it's a little, so you can say that the, the, this kind of measuring zero bias peak staying, staying at zero, that would, that's an indirect, uh, observation of uh, of spin orbit if you have the if you believe kind of the Majorana interpretation 
um, I don't know if you can measure it uh, independently, then you should look at some uh, entry crossings between the bound state that would maybe be more clean mm -hmm. quantum dot uh, geometry. Okay. Maybe it's uh, probably a question and, yeah. to theory collaborators on the long run. But it, yeah, um, um, maybe I guess the, if you do this uh, spectroscopy of, as, as, as you have done with the, with the where you measure the transition and really see the band structure of the spin orbit, that will of course be even more stronger, uh, like in the Tosi Eval paper. Um, Actually, there is a, apparently a question from Sirius slash Luke. Play, yeah. Hopefully it will be sh short. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, when you show the data of density of state, tunneling density of state, there is some structure above the gap. There are some states that uh, that disperse with the yes here. Do you understand yeah. this, uh, these stripes that? Uh, yes, yeah, so I wouldn't say we understand them, but one way to think is that there's some uh, resonances in tunnel barrier that makes this also evolve like that. But uh, to say that we that we understand, but that that would be one explanation that you could have something like like that. Thank you. Okay. So then we have to move on. So thank you, Kasper, again for the for the nice talk. Thank you. And then the next speaker is going to be Marta Pita Vidal from uh, Delft. And hopefully she's already ready. Exactly. <clears throat> and hopefully she can also share the screen at this yes. time. Be nice. And it's full screen and everything. So then, uh, Marta, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, thank you, Attila. Um, I am Marta from QTech in the Netherlands, and I'm going to present some results on a gate tunable and field compatible flexonium. The results are the content of a paper with the same title, which uh, is right now under peer review and, and available in our archive. This device can have multiple applications, where I'm going to present here a specific motivation in the area of topological quantum computing, where we can see uh, Flaxonium as an important step on the way towards making a topological qubit based on Majorana bound states. As we all know, under high magnetic fields and in certain conditions of chemical potential, Majorana can emerge as end states in spin orbit coupled and semiconducting and superconducting proximitized semiconducting nanowires. And their interest in the area of quantum computing comes from the fact that four Majoranas with fixed total fermionic parity can encode the state of a qubit, which is topologically protected against local disturbances. There are multiple theoretical pro proposals for devices that would allow to do topologically protected operations on Majorana qubits based on nanowires. However, the path towards the physical implementation of such devices with protected operations is full of both technical and fundamental challenges, since there are still multiple fundamental questions waiting for an answer, such as can we consistently isolate Majoranas in real nanowires? How well can Majoranas couple to each other? How bad are quasi-particles for state of, uh, of a Majorana qubit, or can we actually operate on the state of a, of a Majorana uh, qubit? Our suggestion to answer all these questions is coupling Majoranas to a flexonium using a nanowire flexonium, which, as we will see, constitutes uh, first a detector of Majoranas. Uh, it second could be used to investigate the coupling between two adjacent Majoranas at the junction. Third, it would allow to explore the parity dynamics on the Majorana state. And fourth, it could be used to do operations in the Majorana qubit state, which will not be topologically protected, would constitute a proof of concept for such operations. So let's see how it works. Here I show a circuit model for an unaware flaxonium without considering for now the possible presence of Majoranas. Its Hamiltonian is basically the Hamiltonian of a flaxonium circuit, characterized by its capacitive, inductive, and Josson energies. And the important novelty of this device as compared to other flaxonium circuits is that the Josson junction is now made out of an indium arsenide semiconducting nanowire, which results on an electrostatically tunable 
junctions transmission and therefore on the possibility of using a uh, gate voltage to uh, to control the Josephson energy. If we diagonalize this Hamiltonian, we can calculate the nanowire fluxonium spectrum for different values of Ej indicated here in the title. And here I'm showing the spectrum as a function of the external flux. Mm. As we will now see, this spectrum has a strong dependence on Ej. Uh, it is a slightly anharmonic LC oscillator for low values of Ej, of Ej as shown here. And as we increase Ej, it becomes more and more fluxonium-like with its characteristic persistent current eigenstates and with a spectrum that is much more enharmonic and much more flux dependent. We consider now the possible presence of Majoranas at both sides of the junction. Um, we see how they will show up as, uh, they will result in very clear spectroscopic signatures. The coupling of uh, two nanowires next at the junction would result in the four pi Josephson effect, which results in this extra term of uh, on the Hamiltonian, which is four pi periodic. And as a result of this of this new term, the spectroscopic lines are expected to split in two different sets of lines, each of them corresponding to a different fermionic parity of the inner Majoranas gamma one and gamma two. And furthermore, this splitting becomes larger as the value of EM, the coupling between the two Majoranas, increases. So if we have Majoranas, we are ready to detect them, to study the strength of their coupling across the junction and to investigate their parity dynamics. Something that is essential for achieving all this is to be able to measure an NWIRE flexonium spectrum for every EJ value and at large magnetic fields because both magnetic fields and fine tuning of gate voltage are required for the emergence of major ions. Our device is able to measure this, so let's see how we have done it. Our implementation of the device looks like this. The capacitive and inductive circuit elements are implemented with a parallel plate capacitor in blue and with a long meandering superinductor in purple. Specifically, the superinductor has a width of 50 nanometers and is made out of a nine nanometer thick film of niobium titanium nitride, which has a large kinetic inductance of around 40 picohenry per square. The values of EL and EC are therefore fixed by the chosen materials and geometry. However, EJ will depend on the magnetic field and can also be tuned with our junction gate, which is situated under a small section of the in numerous nine and wire that is not proximitized by aluminum and that therefore forms the, the junction. These two uncolored gates here are not varied for the results presented here. And importantly, the choice of thin navium titanium nitride as our superconducting material and the absence of the traditional aluminum, aluminum oxide, aluminum SIS just junctions. Uh, result on high magnetic field resilience of this device as compared to other flaxonium devices and in general as compared to other superconducting circuits. And furthermore, the radiometric design of our superinductor, uh, which consists of two symmetric loops, reduces the sensitivity of our device to global flux noise. Which, and, and this happens because equal fluxes through each of the two symmetric loops generate opposite currents that cancel each other at the junction. Um, finally, in order to perform two-tone spectroscopy, we coupled our flaxonium inductively to a uh, lamp element and field resilient readout resonator. So the first thing we do is uh, perform two-tone spectroscopy measurement. And this is what we obtain. Um, we make these kind of measurements as a function of the external flux and from them, we have access to the different transition frequencies of the device. We track the peaks with a peak finding algorithm and feed them with the transition frequencies of the inductively coupled fluxonium resonator system. Here each line is labeled with its corresponding transition, indicating both the fluxonium and resonator states involved. Note that we not only observe transitions like this one, starting from the ground state, G naught, but also uh, from the state with one photon in the resonator, G1, 
like this one. And we also start transition starting from E0, like this one starting from the first excited state of the flux sample. Mm, the model parameters obtained from the feed are the characteristic energies EC, EL, and EJ. The shared inductance ratio between the readout resonator and the flaxonium and the resonance frequency of the readout resonator. So after confirming here that our device is properly described by this simple model Hamiltonian with just a few degrees of freedom, we go on and see what happens when we vary the junction gate voltage. If we monitor the readout resonator's transition, uh, we see that it responds quite strongly to uh, the junction gate voltage, and it does it in a non-monotonic way. It has a fixed frequency for low and high gate values, and it has uh, and it oscillates in an intermediate regime. This is consistent with previous observations and is attributed to different channels opening in the junction with transparencies that oscillate with gate. So the fact that the flaxonium CJ changes with gate results in a frequency change of its transitions. And as these transitions move around in frequency, they push the resonators. Resonance frequency with different strengths resulting on, on this dependence that we observe in, on VJ. To confirm this interpretation, we chose three different gate points indicated here with vertical lines to perform spectroscopy. We observe that we are able to measure the flexonium spectra in all different gate voltages, so in parameter regimes for which the flexonium megahertz states are actually of very different character. As before, we extract the peaks from the spectroscopy data and we feed them with Hamiltonian for the coupled flexonium resonator system. We see that the fits are very precise um, and and they are very precise over the for the different gate points, which means that our model Hamiltonian properly describes the nanowire flaxonium for every value of EJ. In this case, we are fitting only the dark markers, which correspond to the transitions starting from the ground state. These lighter markers correspond to other transitions observed that are not starting from the ground state. In this case, all fit parameters excepting for EJ are forced to be the same for the for the three gate points, and we extract EJ values that overall increase with gate voltage, even if they do it in a non-monotonic way. We have therefore achieved one of our two main goals, which is to do spectroscopy over a large gate range. Our second goal is to do spectroscopy at large in-plane magnetic fields required for the emergence of major We were able to measure spectra over the whole external flux range over uh, up to magnetic fields of more than one Tesla. And here I'm showing two representative spectra at 0 0.5 and one Tesla. We can still fit the spectra accurately in this regime. And from the spectroscopy data, we extract values of EJ, which is the only model parameter largely affected by the magnetic field. And here we appreciate two effects that we see recurrently when doing spectroscopy in field. First is a decrease of EJ with field, and the second is the anomalous Josephson effect, which results on a finite offset of the current phase relation of the junction with wavelength zero. Repeating similar spectroscopic measurements, we can map uh, both EJ and the finite shift, uh, shift versus gate and field. We first look at representative data for EJ versus field, and we see that independently of the gate voltage, um, EJ decreases overall with magnetic field. Uh, this overall decrease is due to the superconducting gap of aluminum closing with field. However, we also observe that for most gate voltage, uh, it does it in a non-monotonic way, which has been observed before in similar nanowires and is thought to be due to the quantum interference of different channels, nanowire junctions with spin-orbit coupling and under a magnetic field. We can, as we said, also map the finite shift as a function of the junction gate. Here we show representative behavior for two values of magnetic field. At zero magnetic field, the zero flux point is constant, constant as a function of the junction's gate. Well, at 0 0.5 Tesla, we observe a finite shift in the zero flux point that varies with VJ and approaches uh, a value of 
pi. This observation agrees with the anomalous just effect, which occurs when chiral and time reversal symmetries are both broken in the junction. In, in the Umarsenite based junctions, the symmetry breaking originates from the interplay between the presence of multiple channels, spin orbit coupling, and the same on splitting due to the applied magnetic field. Um, yep, to conclude, I'd like to summarize the main novelties presented in this work. First, we have made a hybrid device which integrates an Indumarsenite nanowire into a flexonium circuit. Second, we have made spectroscopy measurements which uh, over a large magnetic field and also up to one Tesla under the conditions necessary for the emergence of major and zero modes. Therefore, this device constitutes a detector of the 4 pi Justin effect, which could be used to investigate the coupling of Majoranus and also to read out and operate on topological qubits. And this is all. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Marta, for this nice talk. And now this is open for discussion. So if you want to ask any questions, raise your hand. And I see Sirius slash So please. Yes, uh, on your outlook, uh, what are you missing to go to the Majorana regime since you are at one Tesla already? Yeah, this, um, well, as we, all, as, we all, as we all know, the the presence of Majorana or not in the nanowires depends a lot from device to device, and, and we haven't explored a lot of different devices with different nanowires. But in principle, the device is ready to to detect Majoranas if they are there and coupled to each other across the junction. So what's missing and like the next step is, would be probably to maybe since this has been done with indium arsenide nanowires and, and indium antimonide seem to have some properties that made them more suitable for uh, the presence of Majoranas, maybe it would be to adapt the, the design of this device to incorporate indium antimonide nanowires, which, which should be quite straightforward and try to perform similar experiments on in human timonite uh, flux onion devices. Because as we saw, in, uh, the, the, I didn't show it here also, but for example, the line width of the devices is already quite narrow. So it seems that if the coupling of the, nano, of the majoranus at the junction is uh, strong, it's relatively strong, then it would be direct to, to observe them with these devices. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I see Christian raising a hand, so. Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah, very interesting talk. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, on this the very same uh, um, slide here, you have these uh, two spectroscopy, uh, two-tone spectroscopy data, and I, and I see that um, you, you seem to lose at some frequencies uh, the, the signal. Do you, do you know why? Yes, this happens because, uh, maybe I can show again the, this other slide. Um, our resonator is at a frequency of around 4.5 um, gigahertz, which lands more or less here, which is the, the region where we lose signal in all of the spectroscopy data that we have. And this happens because we're, the Teuton spectroscopy is measured by monitoring the shift in the resonance frequency of the resonator as we excite these other levels of the, of the flexonium circuit. And uh, because of the way of performing the, the spectroscopy measurements, we don't have access to what happens when, uh, around the resonator because, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. That I understand, but uh, on the on the rightmost the one, even yeah. below the resonator, you don't see it. Yeah. So in this case, for this specific, for example, for the previous spec that I showed, we the data below the resonator. In that specific one, uh, we we use the same um, the same power of the excitation signal at every frequency and. Normally, we need a slightly higher power under the resonator. In that case, we didn't use enough power. Mm. But, uh, th this was the reason for this specific case. Uh, for this 
second intermediate gate one, for example, we use a slightly higher power and the resonator, and then we were able to observe it. So I think it's not a, it's not that it's, it's not that it's to observe it in that specific case it was because of the power used. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Martha. So let us thank uh, Martha again for the nice talk and discussion. And now let's move on to Matthew Delbeck's talk that will be about inhomogeneous uh, spin orbit interaction in, on the nanoscale and how to induce it. Okay, hello everyone. Um, okay. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yeah, exactly. You come out uh, clear and you should still put this uh, full screen somehow. Uh, where is that? Uh, where is the full screen option? It's been full screen on my computer. Now. Uh, uh, no, just previously it was full screen. Yeah, you did. Yeah. See. For a second. Is it okay? Uh, no. Nah. no. Just sometimes it flashes full screen. Um, it's strange because so uh, do whatever you do then. I think it's. I, I will stop sharing and share again. Okay. I don't know why it, it was not in full screen. Uh, is it okay? Uh, it's still not full screen. No. Usually it works like that because it's not the first time I'm doing this, but uh, uh, it's strange that it doesn't work. You, you, you see my slides, right? Yeah, yeah, we see the slides. Yeah, at, le at least you see your slides, so then maybe let's, let's just know, move I think, on I like think, this. Okay, okay, let's go uh, like this. I think yeah, you can minimize okay, this. I think it's you. Exactly. If, if, if you click contents, maybe it disappears. Okay. I don't see why content. Well, just, uh, just go uh, ahead. Uh, yeah, there. Uh, maybe. Yeah, yeah, okay, like that. Now. Yeah, okay. now. Okay, okay perfect. I'm sorry. Okay, this is the closest thing to full screen that we have, so then yeah, let's, yeah, let's yeah. just start. And uh, Sorry yeah. for the. Maybe good, maybe good like this. So then, uh, Matthew, the floor is yours, and looking yeah. forward to your talk. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to present these results uh, here. Uh, so we we'll talk indeed that the implementation of an inhomogeneous large spin orbit interaction on a scale, and uh, let's say synthetically. And uh, in this talk, I will uh, discuss uh, I mean, yet uh, other materials than the one we have heard about uh, today, so carbon nanotubes and uh, magnetic fixtures. So the, the main actress of this work is Lauriane Contamin, who was doing a PhD uh, at the time. Uh, Mathieu Desjardins was postdoc uh, still actually, and also still part of the group of Patrick Santos, who is over Cote on the theory side for uh, the support. So as for, I think everyone else uh, in this session, uh, the, the common motivation uh, is to investigate uh, Majorana physics in condensed matter and to realize uh, devices uh, to observe and manipulate them. So the expectations as uh, most of uh, us um, know them is that to study both um, in fundamental aspects uh, in these devices, like superconductivity in spin active materials, and observe these uh, exotic excitations, which should be their own anti particle, and also should exhibit non abelian exchange statistics, which should be uh, instrumental for uh, realizing topologically uh, protected quantum information manipulation. So basically, for all of these uh, aspects, uh, in some sense, uh, one needs to have. Um, it turns out we need to have a quite complex devices, a complex, uh, I mean, a network of, um, of Majorana devices in order to reveal uh, their exotic properties or to manipulate them. So here on the right, this is just uh, one particular uh, proposal of uh, device layout uh, needed uh, to manipulate uh, these uh, Majorana excitations. And so that means that we, we th there is a, a lot of, there are a lot of constraints basically on the materials choice and device layout uh, to realize such um, operations. So the route we are uh, taking is actually to uh, try to lift some constraints from the current conventional recipes uh, based on semiconducting uh, nanowires with intrinsic spin orbit interaction and to actually induce uh, the spin orbit interaction uh, with a magnetic texture uh, as was proposed in many theoretical uh, proposals for uh, 10 years already now. 
And uh, the idea is depicted here on the top left, uh, is that if you can subject a low dimensional conductor to a cycloidal magnetic field, which can be uh, realized by a magnetic texture with a uh, magnetic domains pointing basically out of the plane in an alternating fashion. So this uh, cycloidal magnetic field for a uh, free electron moving in this low dimensional conductor is equivalent to uh, having a constant Zeeman field whose amplitude is uh, given by the uh, the stray field of the magnetic texture, as well as a synthetic rush bar spin orbit coupling uh, with strength is immensely proportional to the period of this um, magnetic texture or the magnetic field cycloid. And so this synthetic spin orbit interaction actually uh, leaves several constraints uh, uh, for the device fabrication because we allow for relating topological superconductivity. Uh, in devices with no intrinsic spin orbit coupling. So we have a larger choice of materials. And also without applying a global external magnetic field, so which could be, uh, would be more compatible with superconductivity. Uh, and in addition, uh, of the topic of this talk is to the give the possibility to pattern uh, inhomogeneous uh, regions of spin orbit interaction uh, in the device. And so in our case, we're interested in uh, using a uh, carbon nanotube as our low dimensional conductor because it is the closest possible to uh, one dimensional conductor uh, as required for the uh, 1D recipe for mRNA and the robots. And also they can be uh, ultra clean. And so uh, without any defects, which is also very helpful in this matter. So we previously uh, realized uh, such uh, synthetic spin amid interaction in a carbon nanotube. So here I just flash uh, these results that were uh, published last year. Uh, so we see here on the left, this is a scanning electron micrograph of the device. So in red, uh, we see the carbon nanotube contacted by two supercoating leads uh, in green. And this carbon nanotube is lying on top of uh, a bottom gate, which is here highlighted in blue. And if we look at the same uh, so device uh, with a magnetic force microscope uh, here on the right, we see on the magnetic texture gate, so which is a cobalt platinum multilayer uh, gate, uh, we see an alternation of light and dark regions indicating uh, so the alternation of the magnetic domains of the, of the gate. And so a cut along the carbon nanotube position shows this oscillation here of uh, the magnetic field at the carbon, position, uh, carbon nanotube position. And so which is uh, what we need to induce this synthetic spin orbit interaction. And so in this device with transport measurements, we could indeed infer a lower bound for the spin orbit uh, interaction in the carbon tube uh, of 1.1 millitron volts, uh, which is actually uh, even, I mean, com comparable or even larger than what you find in, uh, in, uh, for intrinsic spin orbit interaction in uh, semiconductor nanowires like ENS or ENSB. And so in addition, so th this, we measured this uh, synthetic spin orbit interaction uh, in combination with uh, an induced supercoating gap, uh, as well as a, uh, let's say an elusive uh, uh, zero bias peak in the device, which is quite promising for future realization of uh, Mayorana zero modes with such um, uh, material and layout. So it should be therefore straightforward to uh, just add a, a second uh, magnetic texture gate in order to try to induce in the same carbon nanotube uh, two different regions with different spin orbit interaction. Uh, and so this is what we wanted to, to realize. So to make more advanced uh, devices for uh, studying, uh, revealing Majorana zero modes. So the, the device is depicted here on the left. So we made uh, basically a double quantum dot uh, where each the each dot of this double quantum dot is actually subject to the uh, cycloidal magnetic field of a different magnetic texture. And so we see here on the, on the top, sorry, so a scanning electron micrograph of the device uh, with the carbon nanotube in the middle here, vertically, and deposited so on top uh, of uh, our double quantum dot uh, device, which is really standard in, uh, in its layout. Uh, in gray here, we have the normal contact um, Electrodes in blue, these are two uh, magnetic texture gates in cobalt platinum. And in brown, here is the tunnel gate in between the two dots, which is actually coupled to a microwave resonator. I will come back to this shortly. So, again, a micro, uh, magnetic force microscope image shows uh, sh indeed that we have two regions with uh, magnetic domains. And in the middle, here, this is the tunnel gate where we don't see any uh, signal. And if we do a cut along the carbon nanotube position, 
we see that indeed we have two regions uh, in pinkish with uh, the magnetic field oscillating in space. And yeah, then on the normal context and the tunnel gate, here we have no oscillation of the magnetic field. So that is quite promising in the sense that we should have uh, regions with finite uh, synthetic spinomic interaction of that type and regions without any uh, spinomic interaction. And so this, is, uh, this device is embedded in the microwave cavity. Uh, as shown here in the optical micrograph on the right. And we will use actually indeed uh, the tools of uh, circuit uh, quantum electrodynamics to investigate this device. Because it, in the first experiment that I showed in the previous slide, we could infer uh, the synthetic spinner interaction from transport measurements. But here we want to uh, reveal the fact that we have two regions with different spinner interaction. And it will be, uh, if not uh, impossible, very difficult to infer from uh, purely uh, transport measurements. Okay, and I just want to flash here uh, for the fabrication part that we are now using uh, a stapling technique in a ultra high vacuum uh, in order to realize ultra clean carbon nanotube devices. And so this was developed by uh, Tino Cubens in our group. So based on uh, previous works, uh, mostly at the Weissman Institute and Basel University in particular, uh, where uh, we fabricate the whole chip uh, in the clean room and we grow separately carbon nanotubes on the comb of cantilevers, as depicted on the top left picture. And then we, at the last step, we staple this camera tube on top of the device electrodes, as shown here. And you can see uh, this photograph on the, on the bottom right showing the chamber uh, in which we actually uh, staple the camera tube. So this is a sample holder with the, the chip. Uh, in the middle here is the, the device. And here, this is an arm uh, on which there is uh, this comb of cantilever with carbon nanotubes that have been grown in between the, the cantilevers. And thanks to micro manipulators, we can uh, staple the carbon nanotube on our uh, electrodes just before going into the fridge. So the carbon nanotube has seen no uh, fabrication technique in the clean room, no fabrication process. So this, it is uh, ultra clean. And so this is quite, uh, I think, uh, it, it will prove very useful uh, for realizing. Uh, I mean, uh, advanced devices for major uh, physics. Okay, so why do we use uh, a microwave cavity to measure our double quantum dot? Actually, this is a very natural way of measuring uh, such a closed system in the sense that the microwave signal of the microwave resonator uh, will measure basically the ability of an electron to move from uh, the one dot to the other dot, from the level of one dot to the, uh, the level of the other dot. And so uh, by measuring uh, this ability of the electron to move from one dot to the other, actually, we will reveal uh, the spin eigenvalue of the electronic states if it's the same eigenvalue on the right and the left dot. And it will allow us here to compare two regions with different spin motion coupling, different spin orbit interaction. And so it, it will give us an ability to actually observe if we indeed have uh, two regions with uh, spin orbit interaction. So typically, this is the kind of measurement uh, that uh, we realized. Um, so we measure the transmitted microwave signal through the cavity, and uh, we measure both the, evolu the, the evolution of the amplitude of the signal and the phase. And here I show only so how the phase of the transmitted microwave signal uh, changes, or it changes the parameter of uh, our double quantum dot. So, uh, and this is what we observe. So this is the transition between uh, to two levels between the right and left dot. And as we change the external magnetic field, which is applied along the carbon nanotube, and also as we change the detuning in energy between the two dots levels. So what we see is a non, let's say, a trivial uh, response. Uh, we see a finite slope here of this uh, dispersion. And so this, this finite slope indicates that the levels of both dots do not evolve um, I mean, similarly with the applied magnetic field, even though it's global. And so we also observe here a change of slope. So it is first positive, then negative, indicating a non-trivial uh, behavior here uh, in this uh, transition. And we can repeat that for uh, various pairs of uh, electron occupancies uh, of both dots. Uh, so each subplot here is the same as, uh, I mean, similar as the one we have seen earlier in the previous slide. So the magnetic field is swept from minus 200 millitesla to plus 200 millitesla, and the detuning in energy from minus 300 microinfrared to plus 300 microinfrared. And so each subplot corresponds to actually a pair of 
electron occupancy are be told on this double quantum dot. Uh, so for the left dot from four to seven and the right dot from one to four, so these numbers are arbitrary. They are, uh, we are not close to the single electron regime, but they are just uh, I mean, counted from some uh, offset arbitrary uh, region. And so what we observe here is a clear, I mean, a clear four different evolutions with magnetic field and detuning. And uh, we see that there is a clear uh, orbital dependent effect of uh, this spin response uh, of our double quantum dot. And I think this is probably, the, I mean, let's say very elementary way of saying that we have uh, a spin orbit uh, coupling uh, in this device. So we see a clear uh, four different qualitative uh, evolutions. So we can try to, uh, I mean, give a first, um, uh, explanation of what happens in this device. And we start with a very naive model. Uh, that is that uh, we, we, we go back to the, how the magnetic texture affects uh, basically our uh, conductor. And so, as I said earlier, it is uh, equivalent to having a constant uh, Zeeman field, okay? Plus a, a synthetic spin orbit interaction. But so here it is difficult to account for this synthetic spin orbit interaction part. So we can just say that each dot has a constant um, magnetic magnetization, which is not necessarily collinear. And actually the spin orbit interaction uh, induces a normalization of the electron G factor as it does, for example, uh, in bulk materials and quantum matter is usual uh, for many uh, semiconducting materials. And so in that sense, uh, both the G factor uh, and the magnetization uh, will change with uh, the orbitals. And so doing so, we can understand that the, the finite slope we measure here is actually due to an effective uh, electron G factor, which is of the order of 40 to 60, which actually corresponds to the difference in G factor uh, between the right and left dots. However, so of course, this model is very naive because it doesn't explain how mi microscopically the magnetic texture affects uh, this, uh, this parameter, how it normalizes the uh, G factor in each dot. But still, I want to, to show that uh, even though this model is naive, uh, we can reproduce very uh, quantitatively our data and even finally on the, on the micro for the microwave signal. So for two pairs of orbitals, so 7, 4, and 6, 3, uh, both the phase and amplitude of the signal uh, of the microwave cavity are, uh, can be fit, uh, fitted very accurately uh, for the slopes, for the amplitude of the signal, as well as for the change of the contrast. So even though the model is very naive, we can indeed uh, understand, uh, let's say, model uh, how the, the cavity signal is affected by this uh, internal transition uh, in, in the dots due to the magnetic texture. So now we have to understand microscopically how the magnetic texture affects uh, these uh, G factors. And so one way to look at this uh, with hand waving argument is that uh, if we consider uh, basically to how the, the spin part of the wave function is affected uh, by the, the, the magnetic texture, uh, actually it will be uh, a result of the overlap between the electron wave function and the magnetic field of the magnetic texture. So if we have a constant magnetic field, we are here, we change the electrons on the dots, so we change the wave function. Therefore, we change the overlap between the electronic wave function and the magnetic texture uh, stray field. So the spin component will vary. So this is the orbital effect that we are probably measuring. And if we keep the uh, number of electrons constant, but then we change the external magnetic field, we will affect uh, the magnetic texture uh, domain configuration. And again, we'll change the spin component of, uh, uh, of the, the lever. So therefore, we see that we have both an orbital and magnet configuration response, and uh, we need to go uh, um, a bit further in the understanding of uh, the magnetic texture behavior here to uh, microscopically understand what happens. So to conclude, uh, we have realized so uh, previously already so uh, uh, synthetic spin orbit interaction in a material which has no uh, intrinsic crash bar spin interaction. So promising for realizing uh, Majorana uh, zero modes in uh, in these devices in carbon nanotubes. And now we could actually uh, show that it is possible to uh, engineer uh, inhomogeneous uh, regions in space with and without spin-rate interaction. 
which was revealed uh, with the microwave cavity uh, measurement. So the perspective, of course, has to, are to build uh, basically uh, to, to build up on this uh, device's architecture and layout to uh, try to realize uh, advanced uh, experiments for revealing and eventually in the future manipulating Mayonnaise robots. So I thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. So uh, in the interest of time, maybe there is time for one short question. So maybe I can, I can ask the short question. So I was a bit confused about your orbital to orbital map uh, yeah. symmetry conditions of that matrix that you had. Yeah, Either. this one. Yeah. So I mean, if uh, N2 is four, then you only see V pieces. Yeah. So I would naively have expected that if uh, N1 is also some number, depending on the offset, then you would also see the same. Yeah, yeah. But somehow no, this is not the case. Uh, yes. Do you understand why? So, I mean, we, I, I can give you an argument as to uh, why, why we don't see the same uh, evolution with N1. Uh, is that, uh, so th there is a small, uh, you know, I must say first, it's not very clearly visible here, but the slopes are not the same. So they, they are small changes, but not as drastic as, of course, the change of, uh, of shape. And so it's probably due to, I mean, uh, say this explanation that for the left dot and the right dot, uh, we, the, the, basically when we change on the first dot and one, for example, the number of electrons, uh, we do not change significantly the overlap uh, between the electronic wave function and the magnetic texture uh, stress field. Meaning that, for example, mm -hmm. we, have a, we are at a very high uh, electron level filling. Therefore, for, from one to the, from uh, adding one electron doesn't change significantly the overlap. So that, that is one possible explanation for that. I see, okay, thanks. Okay, so thank you again for the, for the nice talk. Thank you. And then uh, let's move on to Lawrence Fuchs' uh, talk, who is already exactly here and can share his screen. So I hope you can see it. Exactly, and then, uh, so then this will be the talk from, uh, by uh, Lawrence Fuchs from Regensburg about anisotropic vortex inductance in aluminum in the, in the Mars I2 deck heterostructures. So Lawrence, uh, thank you for making it and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so hi everybody, um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for letting me give this talk today. Um, I really appreciate it. So what I will show you in the next couple of minutes um, are, are very surprising results um, of our measurements on the vortex inductance in 2D epitaxial aluminum in the mass and Ivito structures. And at the end, I will give you a short outlook on why we think that uh, this could act as a direct proof of unconventional superconductivity in these kind of materials. So our um, main motivation is to understand a little better the, the impact of spin orbit coupling um, on standard uh, S-wave superconductors that are in uh, very vicinity to each other. So let's make it clear what, what the spin orbit coupling does. So it's a spin orbit coupling is an effect that, that binds, so to speak, the, the spins of a quasi-particle to its momentum. And there are two main contributions in 2D to this effect. On the one hand, there's the rush to spin orbit coupling that comes from an asymmetry of the confinement potential of a quantum well. And for our crystal orientation, there's been orbit fields that arise from the rush bar um, are isotropic and always directed perpendicular to the momentum direction. Um, the second term is the, the Besselhaus contribution. This comes from uh, an intrinsic asymmetry caused by the non-central symmetric crystal structure in the indium arsenide. And in this case, the spin orbit fields are not isotropic. And uh, what we want to see is uh, what will happen if we combine the effective spin, effective spin orbit fields with an external Simon field. This uh, should lead to a deformation of the Fermi contour and if we then want to form Cooper pairs out of this uh, on this uh, Fermi surface by adding a, a superconductor on top, this could lead to an uh, anisotropy in the superfluid stiffness, so more or less a superconducting uh, density, which could be uh, measured by an anisotropic Meissner effect, or maybe we could see odd parity P wave like components in the order parameter. So um, normally, so we have seen this now in the session um, many times, normally people make 
very fancy devices like Joseph junctions or nanowires to search for Majoranas. Um, we, however, want to see if we already see signatures of unconventional conductivity in the bulk 2D, which is generally necessary to, to see Majoranas, for instance. So what we do, we take a seven nanometer uh, thick aluminum on indium arsenide film with a two deck uh, buried in here. By opti optical lithography, we pattern this meander structure on our uh, chip. It is, um, it is relative position to the uh, crystallographic axis. And by choosing uh, these lines here, parallel to the 110 direction and making the paths where the current reverses a little thicker, we have a defined current direction. Additionally, we can apply a parallel magnetic field and with an in situ, uh, in -situ rotator, a piezo rotator, we can rotate the parallel field with respect to the crystallographic axis. Um, additionally, we can also apply a perpendicular field uh, to introduce vortices. So uh, the inductance measurement uh, follows a, a procedure that uh, Mesove and Tetrov uh, already used in 1969, so more than 50 years ago. And what we do is we incorporate this RLC uh, resonance circuit into a dilution refrigerator, and we decouple it from the rest of the cryostat by this uh, for um, resistors so that the resonance only happens in here. We then put our sample in series with an, a constant inductor LC and parallel to a capacitor CC. And then we simply measure spectra of, these, uh, of this resonator here for different uh, sample temperatures. And from the resonance frequency and the, the width of the, the resonance, we then can determine the inductance of the sample as well as the resistance. So before we go to the uh, more complicated heterostructure, we wanted to see how a standard S12 superconductor would behave. So we cooled down a seven nanometer thick aluminum film that was grown only on a gallium substrate without a tunic, but with the same geometry. And what we found is if we, uh, so we measured the inductance with the temperature and we saw that we indeed see a good agreement with PCS uh, prediction. And knowing that this temperature dependence looked fine, we asked us what would happen uh, when we additionally apply a magnetic field. So this is what we did. We measured the, the inductance of the sample uh, versus the, the parallel field for three different uh, relative orientations of the B field with the crystal structure. And what we found is that the, the pure kinetic inductance, so perpendicular field is zero, is slightly increasing with the parallel field uh, and it's nearly isotropic. So the increase simply comes from pair breaking effects because um, pair breaking reduces the, the Cooper pair density, which is uh, inversely proportional to the sample inductance. Um, second, we wanted to know what a perpendicular field would, would do on the inductance. And this is what happened. So we applied a, a very small field of two millitesla and here already at zero uh, parallel fields, this exceeded the pure kinetic inductance by far at high fields. Additionally, we applied a parallel field and we still saw uh, a monotonic increase. We then uh, increased the perpendic perpendicular field further and further and we, when we saw that uh, the vortex inductance increases but the overall shape uh, stayed the same. So we have a monotonic increase of kinetic and vortex inductance. So the, the question is, where does this, uh, this large inductance come from? And this is due to the vortices. So in, in type two superconductors, perpendicular fields can penetrate the sample through these uh, flux lines, which are uh, generally known as vortices. And if we apply a supercurrent to such a vortex lattice, together with the magnetic moment of the vortex, this produces a Lorentz force perpendicular to the current. This uh, Lorentz force then accelerates the vortex. And as the vortex has a normal core, um, this produces a damping force. And as we don't have uh, perfect um, samples, uh, defects can, can produce uh, pinning uh, centers that then produce an restoring attractive pinning force. 
With these, we can write the vortex equation of model with the definition of this characteristic deep pinning frequency here, which is typically in the gigahertz regime, and the flux flow resistivity. Um, we can solve the equation and calculate the, the frequency dependent um, impedance of this oscillating vortex lattice. And as we are operating in the low megahertz regime, we can make the, the low frequency limit and get the, the vortex impedance. And we see that this is uh, purely imaginary. So we can attribute this, or we can define the, the vortex inductance per square, which is proportional to the perpendicular field, because with this, we simply tune the, the number of vortices in the system. And it's inversely proportional to this uh, Factor Kp, which is the effective uh, pinning strength. So now that we know uh, how the inductive re response uh, looks like in an innocent conventional S per superconductor, let's go to the, the heterostructure. So we, we did the same thing again. We cooled it down and measure the temperature dependence of the total inductance. And what we saw is we again saw a good agreement with the, with the BCS uh, formula. Additionally, we measured the perpendicular field dependence of the inductance for uh, two different um, positions of a rotator to check if everything is, is isotropic. And we see, yes, so for both relative orientations, we see a more or less linear dependence of the inductance on the, on the perpendicular field, as we would expect it. So in, in B, parallel equals zero, zero we see uh, that it, everything uh, is isotropic. So with no magnetic field, we see that there's, we have no uh, preferred direction, there's no anisotropy. And uh, with that in mind, we wanted to see what happened if we the break the, the isotropy by implying an in-plane field and rotate it in a full circle. So we applied a moderate field of half a Tesla and measured the inductance as a function of the angle, so of the relative orientation of field uh, with respect to the crystal axis. And what we saw is that if we don't have a perpendicular field, so no vortices, we measure the pure kinetic inductance, this is nearly isotropic. You can see a polar plot of that. We only have a variation of uh, below than 10%. But if we then uh, apply additionally a perpendicular field, so we get what this is, we see that it turns out to be highly anisotropic. So the, the inductance rises again, and it's becoming uh, um, very un anisotropic. Then we again uh, increase the perpend perpendicular field further and further, and we, we saw that the inductance uh, went up and the anisotropy became uh, clearer and clearer. So what we could uh, deduce from it is that the vortex inductance is, is strongly angle dependent in a finite field. And we can already define two main relative orientations where the uh, inductive uh, response is maximal or minimal. But what was unclear was how the inductance which would emerge from an uh, isotropic case in zero parallel field to this very anisotropic case in uh, 500 millitesla of parallel field. So what we did is, we um, took these two orientations and we measured the parallel field dependence. And this is what we got. What we found was a strongly non-monotonic heat dependence of the vortex inductance, besides the, the asymmetry that we saw earlier. So for very small fields, we see an increase of the inductance, which is presumably caused by uh, paramagnetic air breaking, before we then have a crossover to a, a decreasing regime, where we see a strong enhancement of the pinning. Um, at last, we wanted to study what will happen in very high fields. And what we found was um, that the, the vortex inductance increases again at very uh, high fields because we reached uh, the critical parallel field. And for intermediate fields, we see this, this minimum. Here we, we find um, enhancement of the pinning, which is then in competition with uh, pair breaking effects that eventually let the inductance diverge again. So the, the question is uh, where the, this, this strong pinning comes from. In the normal S-wave superconductors, vortices are pinned because they can uh, save condensation energy if they reside at small defects, because here, um, 
quasi particle scattering can help the, the superconductor to sustain this deformation of the water parameter, which is necessary because the core of the vortex is, is normal. In unconventional superconductors, however, um, hair breaking can also happen around non-magnetic impurities. Um, and this uh, can reduce the, the free energy cost of a vortex to nucleate. So here the Anderson theorem is broken and the, the vortex can save energy um, by non-magnetic hair breaking. So what we see is that uh, pinning is strongly enhanced in unconventional superconductors. And we basically can have two possible uh, unconventional superconducting states emerge in the system. One of them are so-called helical states. Um, these uh, come from the fact that the, the Fermi contours of spin orbit split bands are shifted when we apply an in-plane field perpendicular to the field direction. And this leads to a, a spatial phase modulation of the order parameter because we get this finite uh, pairing momentum Q here. In this system, the, the time reversal symmetry is broken, but however, it is uh, relatively robust against this order um, as opposed to the, the FFF, FFLO state. Um, this uh, modulation wave vector Q is proportional to the spin orbit coupling and to the applied field, so um, it's field tunable. So this could be one of the possibilities that we, we have for uh, pairing uh, interaction here. Uh, the second possibility are P-wave triplet states that can occur in 2D systems with a rush for spin orbit coupling. Here we can get a spin singlet triplet mixing as Kokov and Rashba have calculated. And our hypothesis would be that the parallel field uh, favors the P-wave component of the order parameter over the, the singlet component. Um, Hayashi and Kato, for instance, have calculated the the um, depth of the pinning potential in P-wave superconductors and in standard S-wave superconductors. And what we can see here that indeed in chiral P-wave superconductors, the pinning potential is much deeper and therefore the inductance should be much smaller in the system. So what I have shown you is that uh, the vortex impedance is uh, dramatically anisotropic if we apply an in-plane parallel magnetic field. We have a strong increase of the pinning strength, a factor of over 10 in parallel fields as a signature of uh, unconventional order parameter. The anisotropy of the vortex inductance is probably related to the anisotropy of the spin orbit coupling itself because we have a, a Dresselhaus component. But the, the detailed structure of the order parameter, so whether it's, it's chiral singlet or triplet, uh, still needs to be identified. And um, we acknowledge uh, the discussions with uh, Jörg Schmalian from KAT, who made us uh, uh, clearer the, the effects of spin orbit coupling on superconductivity. So with this, I'm at the end and open for some of the questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lorenz. So then the talk is open for discussions. So please raise your hand if you have any. Any question, comments? Maybe I can ask a question. So, how would you how would you be able to distinguish between the chiral singlet and the chiral triplet with this technique? Um, this is the big question at the moment. So, so one thing would maybe so far we only looked at uh, the vortex inductance more or less, so the, the parallel field dependence of the vortex inductance. But here you can see the um, the pure kinetic inductance in a parallel field. And here we see for this one configuration, we see more or less this kind of plateau. And in the other case, we see this uh, monotonic increase. And maybe only, so, so from the kinetic inductance itself, maybe it is possible to, to check due to pair breaking if it's uh, singlet or triplet. But this is still not clear yet. I mean, the, the, the normal way to do it would be like uh, measuring NMR, uh, the night shift to see whether it's triplet or singlet, but um, this is not so easy. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So if there are no other questions, then maybe let's move, uh, let's thanks Lawrence again. And uh, let's move on to the next talk, which will be given by Lawrence Serra. Again, us to unmute.
Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, perfectly, and yeah. you are you on full screen, so... It's okay? Go ahead, yeah. Well, seems okay. to be great, so then uh, looking forward to the talk, uh, Lorenz. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lorenz Serra. I am at the University of the Balearic Islands, and I am presenting a work done in co collaboration with Kave Del Fanatsari, who was at the University of Cambridge, and is now at the University of Glasgow. The work has been uh, published uh, in this first part and uh, is also in the process of publication or being published. Sorry, uh, we don't see you in the video. Maybe. Oh, sorry. You want to, yeah. Okay. So, how do we start video if you want? If not, it's okay. No, no, sure. Uh, in, the, in the Zoom. The lower left corner of the lower the left in screen. Zoom. You should see a camera icon. Start video. Uh, no, but sorry, but I lost now the. Maybe you if you stop sharing for a minute and. Ah, okay. No, yes. Now I see. Yeah. Now we see you. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. okay. That's good. And put uh, the screen. Yes, now in full screen. Yes, it's okay. okay. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Right. Thanks. Okay, yes, now. So um, it is uh, well known uh, that um, the combination of uh, superconductivity, spin orbit interaction, and magnetic field uh, can lead to the uh, formation of uh, Majorana states in one dimensional wires. I emphasize here the, the property of one dimensional character of the wires as shown in this um, scheme, um, um, where I, I have in mind, uh, or these uh, wires are um, very, um, the, the transverse dimension is rather small. So there are very little number of propagating modes along the wire. And uh, the Majorana states are formed at the uh, edge, which is in contact with the superconductor. In this type of geometry in one dimensional wires, the maximal field effect occurs when the field is in parallel direction to the wire. And the required fields are usually uh, of the order of a fraction of a Tesla of, or half a Tesla. Uh, in my contribution in our work, uh, the type of wires we are interested in are planar wires in the shape of a strips as we uh, show in this uh, sketch, where uh, they have a two-dimensional character with a transverse uh, uh, dimension uh, given by um, a distance Ly. We call this uh, type of wires two-dimensional, quasi-one-dimensional wires because they are confined in the, in the transverse direction. And for this type of uh, wires, the maximal field effect for the formation of Majorana modes occurs in the perpendicular direction. Uh, as opposed to the parallel direction of the 1D wires I mentioned previously. Why is this so? This is because uh, in this type of geometry, the magnetic field leads to uh, important or to large um, orbital effects. And uh, we can take advantage of this orbital field effect uh, for the formation of the Majorana modes in the nanowires. Actually, the fields can be as low as 0 0.01 Tesla in this uh, type of uh, geometry, this type of wires. The overview of my talk, first I want to very briefly uh, present the theory we have used to describe the topological phases of the planar wires in vertical magnetic field. Then I will present experimental evidence uh, obtained uh, in, uh, by Cave, And finally, I will uh, comment some conclusions of our work. For the theory, uh, we uh, have used uh, what is nowadays more or less the standard model for uh, Majorana modes in, sem in, in hybrid semiconductor superconductor wires in a bogolyubov de um, framework of quasi-particles, the Hamiltonian contains the degree of freedom of the charge of the quasi-particles, electron and holes, that we describe with tau Pauli matrices. Then we have a spin described by sigma Pauli matrices, sigma x, sigma y here. 
And uh, um, in addition, we also have the degrees of freedom uh, for the motion in the XY plane. The Hamiltonian contains the kinetic energy contribution, uh, a chemical potential represented by a parameter mu, then a spin orbit interaction characterized by a parameter alpha, a Zeeman term uh, coupling with the spin in the Z component for the vertical magnetic field, and uh, parameter delta B that is representing the Zeeman energy. And then we also have the superconductivity induced by proximity with the superconductor represented by parameter delta zero. And these are the three ingredients I mentioned previously, the spin orbit interaction, the Zeeman energy, and the superconductivity. In the vertical field uh, orientation, we also include the orbital uh, effects uh, originating in the magnetic field. We have three terms that depend on the magnetic length parameter, LZ, LZ minus two uh, is uh, proportional to the magnetic field. And two of these terms originate in the kinetic energy and the third one uh, here, depending on parameter alpha, um, originates in the spin orbit interaction. For a magnetic field uh, of uh, around 0.1 Tesla, the magnetic length is about 80 nanometers. And for uh, uh, typical values of the spin orbit intensity, the spin orbit length is, is on the order of 50, 100 nanometers. So uh, we consider a strip, a two dimensional nanowires whose transverse uh, width LY is let's say 100 nanometers or larger will be in the regime that the spin orbit interaction is very strong and the magnetic length is also very strong. And uh, this is precisely the regime we are interested in. We have met, uh, many modes propagating in the wire and uh, um, spin orbit and orbital effects are strong. Uh, here I show the phase diagrams we have uh, calculated for a two-dimensional strip in vertical magnetic field and in proximity to the superconductor. We assume a transverse width of 150 nanometers and uh, a superconductivity of 0.3 milli electron volts. The three panels are the phase diagrams uh, with new chemical potential in milli electron volts in the vertical axis and magnetic field in the horizontal axis. The three panels are for three different values of the spin orbit intensities. And in each panel, uh, we can see the regions uh, in which a Majorana mode is present at the, at the end of the nanowire. They are indicated with the letter M and uh, they are um, the, the border between topological and trivial regions are indicated here with the cyan lines. The different colors, uh, are the regions, uh, are, sorry, are um, the number of propagating modes in the normal white indicated in this uh, color code. As we can see, the um, topological regions for Majorana modes more or less correspond to uh, regions with different numbers of propagating modes in the um, in the normal nanowires, in the nanowire without superconductivity. The black line is indicating the region with gapless uh, mode in the hybrid nanowire with super induced superconductivity. So we see that in this upper part of the diagram, there are um, uh, gapless propagating modes. When we uh, look at the evolution for a relatively weaker spin orbit interaction, to a stronger a spin orbit interaction, we see that the phase diagram then uh, shows uh, the formation of Majorana regions at lower chemical potential and lower magnetic fields. While in this region, Majorana modes were absent for, for instance, with a 30 milli electron volt nanometer. We have uh, considered the barrier uh, the sensitivity to the barrier, uh, when we uh, look at the conductance, 
uh, in a um, junction between a hybrid uh, superconducting wire and a normal wire with a barrier at the interface, the barrier sensitivity uh, is very um, uh, is of useful property because it can allow to uh, make a difference, make a distinction between the, the topological regions of the hybrid superconductor and the normal regions. Actually, uh, here I show the conductance we have calculated as a function of magnetic field for a fixed um, chemical potential and uh, increasing the magnetic field. The system evolves from trivial to topological to trivial to topological uh, regions. And the different curves are the results uh, for different heights of the interface barrier. Uh, in milli electron volts. As, as you can see, when we increase the height of the barrier, uh, the conductance decreases uh, for the trivial uh, region, for the trivial phase of the hybrid superconductor. It decreases, but in the topological region, the conductance stays more or less constant, is uh, insensitive to the height of the barrier. In uh, the next trivial region, the topological again decreases when increasing the barrier height and uh, it uh, again stays in a plateau value uh, for the next um, topological region. So we see that uh, the sensitivity to the barrier leads to the formation of conductance dips uh, before the onset of Majorana modes, uh, of regions with Majorana modes. We have like an, uh, a sequence of dips uh, followed by uh, higher values of conductance. For a wide function, uh, if we consider a, a, a wider uh, strip of uh, 225 nanometers, we observe that the phase diagram tends to um, concentrate the topological regions uh, towards the lower part of the magnetic field, towards lower magnetic field. They somehow squeeze to the left part of the diagram. Again, the conductance shows the formation of deeps. Um, followed by uh, higher values of conductance in the Majorana, uh, in the topological phases. This property, uh, the, this formation of dips is something we will uh, comment uh, later when showing the um, experimental results. If we, uh, we have also calculated the finite strip, the uh, hybrid superconductor with two normal uh, attached to two normal uh, sides with barrier and the interface and the conductance show uh, some, um, similar behavior with the formation of dips followed by higher values of conductance in the topological regions. I turn now to in the in the last part to comment about the experimental results obtained in Cambridge and Glasgow labs, and they are available in this preprint, in this archive preprint. The central part is a picture of the, um, the array of devices that has have been fabricated by depositing uh, niobium micro, microelectrodes on top of uh, two-dimensional electron gas. On the left part of, on this left panel, uh, we see a transverse cut of the layers of the material. The red is, indicates the position of the two-dimensional electron gas or the indium gallium arsenide two-dimensional electron gas. And the gray indicates the position of the niobium uh, microelectrodes deposited on top. In the, in the right panel, we see a zoom of one particular device uh, showing that the apparent uh, size from the picture is that the transverse uh, width is uh, around four microns and the distance uh, between uh, the, the niobium uh, electrodes is about 150 nanometers. So this is an, an array of Josephson junctions that have been fabricated in the, in, in the Cambridge and Glasgow labs and in the lower panel uh, we indicate, this sketch indicates um, uh, the, the formation of the hybrid system with the niob niobium superconductor uh, inducing superconductivity on the electron gas uh, 
process uh, that lies uh, beneath, uh, below uh, the electrode. So we can expect for, for uh, appropriate parameter ranges the uh, appearance of Majorana modes at the ends of the, um, of the niobium electrode and at the position of the stars indicated in the diagram. For the modeling, I, I show here what we expect with the previous model I mentioned when we consider a wider wire, uh, one micrometer uh, transverse dimension. And in this case, as I already uh, indicated, the phase diagram is characterized by having um, um, many uh, topological transitions at low magnetic fields. Actually, for a wide micron, this is the phase diagram. The purple is the trivial regions, and uh, the red, the green, sorry, uh, indicates the the topological regions. So when we move along one of these lines, increasing the magnetic field, we expect a sequence of many uh, low field, trivial topological transitions. In order to characterize the conductance and based on our previous results, we have used the phenomenological modeling where uh, for, for, um, for trivial regions, uh, uh, sorry, for topological regions, we assume the conductance is flat and is simply given by the number of propagating modes. And for the trivial regions, we expect the formation of dips in the conductance. Um, here, we simply characterize them as a quadratic, uh, a quadratic dependence with the magnetic field. So for instance, if we assume uh, 11 electron volt chemical potential and we uh, increase magnetic field, we expect the formation of a dip followed by a plateau, a higher value of the conductance, then uh, another dip and so on. A sequence of dips and qualitatively is the same uh, type of behavior for different magnetic fields. These are the results of the measurements and uh, we see the conductance as a function of the magnetic field when we, um, for decreasing temperatures, the different colors are for decreasing temperatures. We see how um, uh, at low magnetic fields, uh, there are um, these um, oscillations or there are uh, oscillations uh, which occur at uh, rather low values of the magnetic field that are in qualitative agreement with the expectation from the topological transitions at low magnetic field. On the right panel, uh, we see a zoom of this low field region and uh, we see these dips uh, of conductance and um, they are uh, quite robust and um, reproducible. Uh, um, the different colors here correspond to different uh, rates for the magnetic field, uh, for changing the magnetic field, and we see that they remain at the same position. Another aspect of the um, experiment is that it presents a hysteresis. Uh, when uh, the magnetic field uh, is uh, increased or is decreased, the dips uh, up, uh, appear on different, let's say, on uh, like mirror image, a curve one re with respect to the other. Here, uh, red corresponds to decreasing magnetic field and blue to increasing magnetic field. We um, uh, attribute, or one possibility to understand this, we think is um, assuming that the effective field, in internal effective field in the sample is different from the external field because possibly uh, of the um, existence of magnetic impurities that make a difference between these two, uh, two fields. Assuming in a phenomenological modeling, uh, this type of behavior of effective field with respect to external field with a sudden jump when the internal magnetization is reoriented, then we expect this type of uh, conductance showing the lower panel, which is again in qualitative agreement with the expectation, uh, with the measurements um, showing the sequence of dips, but appearing on um, asymmetric curves, which are mirror image one with respect to the other regarding the in, uh, increase of magnetic field or decrease of magnetic field. And with that, I, I, um, I am at my conclusions. Um, Planar hybrid wires in vertical field have topological phases hosting Majorana modes at low fields. This is because of the um, um, relevance of the orbital field effect. Uh, the 
conductance uh, of the normal hybrid superconductor junction is sensitive to the barrier at the interface, and this barrier leads to um, deep C conductance that allow to distinguish trivial and topological phases. And we have also shown evidence uh, indicating that these deeps or con low field magnetoconductance oscillations provide experimental evidence of the Majorana phase transition at low fields. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Lawrence, for the nice talk. And um, maybe there is time for one short question. So uh, there is one from Ruben, and so I unmute him. Thank you for the very interesting talk. I would like to know uh, what is the size of the super topological superconducting gap in this kind of material? Uh, the size of the topological superconducting gap uh, is uh, smaller than the, the, the parameter we are using, which is 60, 60 microelectron volt, but I think it's about um, maybe a fraction of that, about uh, one tenth of that or something like that. Thank you. Okay, so let us thank uh, Lawrence once again for the, for the nice talk. And then we move on to the last uh, talk and invited talk of the session given by Javad Shabami from uh, NYU. Uh, but before doing that, uh, the organizer has asked us to make some nice group picture at the end of the end of the session. And so for that, uh, I ask you not to leave afterwards and then uh, we'll just open the camera uh, video possibility for everybody and then we can make a nice group picture online. That will happen after uh, Javad finished his talk. Um, Javad, I see that you are already online. Uh, please share your screen and we are happy to host you uh, despite this very early hour at you. Uh, looking forward to, uh, forward to your talk. So please, yeah, the floor so is much. yours. Thank you for the invitation and I'm, I'm very glad to be here. I guess, you know, with all the things going on, uh, hopefully next year or in some of the future years, we can meet in person. Uh, so today, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the progress uh, in realizing topological superconductivity in planar Josephson junction. Uh, I will try to give you a picture and, you know, the challenges and the advantages of this kind of system and then how it may come together. So this is part of a, a relatively uh, a large collaboration. Um, so we have material science uh, work in this. Uh, a lot of it on actually re relevant topics that was covered earlier in this session on epitaxial deposition of superconductors and semiconductors. Uh, we are trying to understand this theoretically of how you can actually stabilize myronas in a uh, planar junction. And uh, some uh, quick, I guess, um, experiments with different material system to just sort of see if the basics are correct or not. Um, so general interest, uh, I guess, uh, for this audience is that, you know, topological superconductivity will host Majorana fermion. If that is true, there is a path to quantum information, uh, which is, again, has a lot of uh, challenges and advantages. Um, another thing that actually is a byproduct of this is that you have superconductivity, you have system with a spin or with coupling, and then you can actually marry them uh, to make superconducting a spin chronic. So this is very similar to a spin fed, but now you have it in the Josephson junction, and um, there has been great progress actually in that direction. Excuse me. So um, about I want to say eight and ten years ago, I guess that it was this, uh, realized that maybe it's very difficult to actually harness uh, this kind of superconductivity in nature, but rather than that, we can actually engineer kind of physical structures that have the properties that we need, and and that is basically superconductivity and a spin orbit plus some um, uh, Zeeman interaction. So uh, I guess Kitai was basically the pioneer of this to basically starting with this uh, toy model. Uh, but then I guess conceptual feature is that I want to have all these terms uh, where my quasi particles are. So basically if I put a superconductor with the SP pairing and a semiconductor uh, with a spin orbit, at that very interface, maybe the particles can actually inherit those properties. So in this talk, I will mainly focus on indium arsenide as a system that will host the spin orbit and aluminum as a system that has a spin pairing. And the in plane field is mainly applied by uh, magnet uh, in, in, this, in the lab. 
So, so these structures, I think, went to a new stage when uh, this epitaxial uh, growth of superconductors and semiconductors were discovered uh, back in 2015. Uh, the history of this kind of growth actually goes way back into the, uh, I think, 1973. It was one of the second things to do with after the invention of MBE. But what was not very realized, I guess, or maybe we didn't have that good of a TM image, is that how well we can make these interfaces. And especially for aluminum, a lot of it was high temperature growth. So you wouldn't get a 111 phase that actually goes epitaxially on the systems. So on nanowires, uh, 2015, then on two days in 2016, uh, we basically uh, managed to put aluminum um, on the domain match structure on, uh, on indium arsenide. In case of two days, it turns out actually indium arsenide and aluminum are interacting heavily. So you actually need to put something in the middle. On the in-gas phone eight, it, it actually is a lot easier. But this is a challenge. It's, I mean, I show you TM image, it looks easy, but it's an ongoing effort in our lab for at least three, four years trying to just producing this at a high throughput value. So once you have that system, you obviously want to know what is aluminum doing and what is a semiconductor doing. And now you can only access the semiconductor by removing the aluminum. That usually involve, involves an edge. Um, and uh, there are very nice selective process actually, it's industry-based, uh, but any process has its own uh, side effects, right? So given that uh, already included, we actually can get mobilities up to 40, 40 45,000 uh, centimeters squared per second. This is a longitudinal and whole data um, up to 12 Tesla on one of the samples that you can see the actual oscillations can start around one and a half Tesla. You see nice well-developed quantum Hall effect. And uh, this sample also has some overlapping uh, state at the surface, right? Because if I grow this inside the structure where it doesn't see the superconductor, I can get to uh, 600,000 mobility, right? But if the, the challenge is to bring it at the surface and I actually have it talking to the aluminum. So there is uh, a lot of progress there. We actually are now publishing all the mobility and measurements and all the good and bad things online on our website. So if you go here and click, you will see when the machine has been down, what we have grown and how much have we have grown and if the quality is good or bad. It's just, this is a continuous optimization. And, um, but we have learned quite a bit uh, from the material science part. Um, we have a paper in uh, JVAC-B 2018 and a new one 2020 I forgot to put here. And uh, for example, in this particular case I'm showing on the left side, if you grow aluminum and gallium and temonite, it actually um, doesn't try to form a very nice epitaxial layer. Um, so if you just basically, um, put aluminum directly on gallium and temonite, you get the right graph. And if you try to actually put two mono layers of aluminum and temonite, you get the left graph. So if you look at the left, you can see actually aluminum film is going in a planar, but on the right hand side is kind of a polycrystalline with some sort of a reaction at the surface. So it turns out actually this, um, I guess you could call it a diffusion barrier or uh, intermediate layer is very important, especially even for the arsenide. So if you just put aluminum on indium arsenide, you will get a very rough surface and very surprising results. But again, with some sort of a tweak in engineering, you can get it to work beautifully. Um, so once you have the material, you know, in our case is a two inch wafer that comes out of the machine, uh, then you can do nanofab. Um, I guess unlike nanowires, we are, it's easier for us to remove the aluminum and make a Josephson junction. So the top left uh, is basically showing an SCM, I'm sorry. Um, SCM image of one of these uh, Josephson junctions. These are the ones that we study in this um, uh, in this talk. They're rather long, uh, four micron, and then the gap between the superconducting uh, contacts are about 100 nanometers. So we call it L here. And in this particular graph on the right hand side, I'm varying it from uh, 50 nanometer to about a micron. And uh, we grow it obviously on many samples. That's one of the standard characterization. And it turns out um, there is a so the, the, all the nominally all the aluminum is epitaxial. We don't do anything that is not epitaxial. But the sample quality of the two they could be different, right? I, I, want, I just showed you one that had forty thousand mobility. I have one that is five thousand. I have one that is ten thousand. So sample A and B are actually different in that sense that the two days are quite a bit different, and sample A has a lower quality in terms of mean free pass and mobility, right? That, that's kind of my measure. And as you see, um, if the parameter regime that you will be for the same device will be different. Uh, even though it's epitaxial, I can tell you that these samples will give you completely different results. The ones that I will show you in this talk 
are from the best quality two days and the best of uh, contacts. If you don't use that, uh, you will see all sorts of um, strange results that you could connect it in interesting physics, but uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be cautious and not do that. Uh, so if you have a good Josephson junction, everything is healthy, you see a good front half a pattern. Uh, you see, um, obviously, a supercurrent on the top uh, main panel. Uh, there's hysteresis in our junctions, usually, because of the way that the heating works in these junctions. Um, you, you can usually measure it at a higher temperature to make their, you know, the thing go away. Or you can shunt it, but shunting is a little bit tricky because some of the junctions, depending on the geometry, could have a high RN, and then, then that can cause trouble. But anyway, so for the ICRN values, uh, we can get, you know, if you are short ballistic, you expect a textbook number of a pi. We get about 2.5, 2.8, I think is the highest we've gotten. And the access current usually tells you about how good the aluminum is, for ex aluminum uh, contact to the two that is. And for sample A, for example, is almost zero. Uh, for sample B is like 1.5 here, right? So the good samples, are usually have a good IC, I access current to, um, Anyway, so for, for this topic, we were interested in topological superconductivity. My run of fermion, you probably heard a lot about the nanowires and uh, how uh, we can actually engineer a system over there. And it's, the theory is also much simpler and you can kind of drive it and understand what, how the, each parameter plays a role. In, a in 2017, uh, Pienka at Harvard and Hell in Copenhagen, I'm sorry, the, the reference must be coming. Um, they, they basically propose a new geometry that if you make the Josephson junction very thin and long, um, if you apply a magnetic field in the plane, you actually have to stabilize uh, my runner fermions. And in this particular case, if you basically pi phase bias it, you can actually in principle get my runner from zero field. Uh, that's a simpler story. And there have been uh, immediate experiments after that, that actually look at the tunneling inside the squid loop. And uh, on the left side, you see the data from uh, Copenhagen and aluminum and indium arsenide. Uh, and on the right-hand side, uh, from mercury telluride. I don't think in any of them, there was a Majorana fermion at zero field, but the disorder and everything else, I guess you expect it to be pushed up. Uh, so it, it looks like a promising path, but uh, work to be done uh, to optimize it. So to understand the theory for ourselves uh, and understand the realistic parameter space, we actually, uh, with our collaborators, Alex Mattis, Ibiagan, and Igor Zurek, we actually simulated a lot of these systems uh, in, in finite element, um, uh, trying to actually remove some of the assumptions that have been made, uh, at least in the PRX paper by Pienka. And here is the, the, the theory actually citations. Um, so if you do pi phase, that's exactly what you expect to have my run early on. Um, if you have no bias, when the spectrum actually closes the gap, you expect, uh, uh, I guess, a self-tuned pi phase appearing under the junction if you have a loop. Uh, but what we can measure, or we can measure phase, uh, but it's a difficult measurement, but we have done it that I uh, will show you data here. But also what you can look at is the supercurrent. Uh, so the supercurrent uh, presumably has to actually go, uh, when the gap closes, it has to also uh, have a vanishing number and then reopen uh, when the system is in a P type superconductivity. So it is interesting to sort of see if the, you know, the parameters are in realistic model and, and if you are in the right regime or not. Uh, a very competing physics is the BFFLO um, that we, we actually heard two, three talks ago. Uh, that basically depends on the Talus energy and, uh, um, and, and the Zeman. And, and you can basically drive a formula out of it that uh, relates to the Fermi velocity, which is your density, the square root of density, and inversely proportional to L. So if your density is low, and you have a wide junction, right? Uh, this number B FFLO is going to be a small number, right? Uh, for example, in mercury telluride, uh, the VF, the densities are usually few, 10 to the 11. L that have been done in experiments uh, are on the order of uh, half a micron to a micron. So the, around the less than a Tesla, you can actually drive the system uh, to a BFFLO. In, uh, in, uh, in your marcenite, usually the density is 10 to the 12. Uh, L, we usually work with 100 nanometer. So if you actually calculate uh, what is the equivalent number uh, for, for the system I will show you, uh, you expect nine Tesla uh, to be the BFFLO of this system. So in this graph, I'm plotting uh, basically the BFFLO as a function of L for a range of uh, Fermi velocities. So sort of the spread um, of the color is, is telling you basically is the density between 5e11 and I think it's 1e2 to 12. And we are on the blue graph. And, uh, 
you, I guess you see the data around the micron and you know, around 100 nanometer, it completely diverges because you basically need nine Tesla to drive the system there. And you know, aluminum doesn't survive at that high, even if it's very thin. So, so basically we make these devices on a squid loop. They are both they're gated separately. So I can basically deplete one junction and only look at uh, the other, or basically try to actually measure at the relative phase that I can measure uh, between them. The critical field, uh, I guess I'm giving the numbers here, 1.5 Tesla, the mean free passes around 200 nanometer. The critical field is enhanced because these are very thin aluminum and the ICRNs are reasonable. It's just on a good wafer. So basically the main observation that we have is that uh, if you actually apply, uh, just follow the recipe that the theory tells you, right? So we make this device, you see supercurrent. Now you apply a magnetic field along the junction and you will look for the supercurrent to see what happens, right? Uh, I have another knob, which is the gate voltage. And in this setup, I'm only looking at the single junction. So the other junction is depleted and we are looking at, let's say junction one. And uh, the gate voltage in this particular case is, uh, I think is minus two volt. And the spin orbit in the systems vary quite a bit. Uh, we have earlier papers that show that the spin orbit um, basically goes from zero to about 100 MeV angstrom um, uh, with just gate voltage. So if the gate voltage is a small, you basically this space superconductivity just disappears in a very standard picture that we all expected to. The critical field of the soup junction is 1.2 Tesla, 1.5 was the aluminum. So it kind of all makes sense. If you increase the gate voltage um, to a positive number, let's say, I think in this particular one is positive uh, plus 1.5 volt. Uh, you actually see on the same device, same temp, everything is the same, it's just changed the gate voltage. You see that supercar basically closes gap at 0.6 Tesla and then reopens and it disappears around 1.2. So this is very similar to the calculations that I showed you. The field is in a small range, it's, it's not BFFLO. Uh, but again, this is not enough to say that uh, we have a pre-wave superconductivity. It is very interesting to actually measure the phase. So here are actually the gate voltages, I'm sorry. Um, so minus 1.5, the gap, uh, basically there is no gap closing. 1.4, there is gap closing. And I will show you many junctions that will show this kind of behavior on the ones that we understand as spin orbit and gating on. And so basically, I can basically not do this junction, go to the other junction, do this measurement, I'll see the gap closing again. Um, oh, here is the spin orbit as a function of density. Uh, and as you see, if you focus on the uh, blue graph on the right, you will see that basically, I'm sorry, let me see, yeah. So the alpha parameter, which is, uh, basically driving most of the physics in the systems, you know, varies very quite sharply uh, with the gate voltage and density. So these are deduced from recanty localization and how directly relevant they are for a Myron experiment. Maybe, you know, there are some, um, I don't think it is one to one, but, but at least it shows that the spin orbit is a very fast function um, of the system. So what we can do, we can get a phase diagram. Uh, if I see that zero bias in those graphs and now continuously sweep gate voltage and magnetic field. What I showed you was that, for example, at minus two, there was no transition. And that's what you will see if you get a horizontal cut on this graph. And then uh, you will see that around one, one Tesla, 1.2 Tesla, basically this disappears. Uh, this phase diagram is actually for the other junction to basically show you two of these. Um, so the raw data was from junction one, and this is from junction two. Uh, if the gate voltage is, is high, uh, so basically now the spin orbit is high and then I can do a S wave to TP type transition and you can basically clearly see that in this graph. So uh, the nice thing about this phase diagram is that now if I go back to a squid loop geometry, I can park one of the junctions in let's say minus two volt. So it will never do a transition from S to P. So it's always S wave or one type. And then I can ram the other one, right? So if first it's S and then it keep going up to the P. So when I'm measuring S and S, I don't expect much. When I do S and P, then we will see what we see. Um, so there's a very also interesting angle dependence is basically very narrow, about 10 degrees, this kind of gap closing, or I guess current closing goes away and it all becomes simple, which is again, very consistent uh, with the chirality of the Myrons. So if you basically now try to uh, use the geometry as a squid loop, um, you have full gateability, I guess, uh, I've already shown you that, but on the right-hand side, you can sort of see the low field um, characterization, right? So you kind of see a sawtooth at the final temperature. The transparency that you get from the top graph is 0.9 plus minus 0.1. That's kind of the error bar. 
And this is the junction transparency, right? I'm not talking anymore about the contact transparency. This is the full device. Um, and when you go in field, the transparency drops. And, and that's, I think, is also expected, but I don't have a good explanation for it. Um, I think experimentally, that is very consistent. So if you now kind of tune ourselves to where we want to be, so I want to park myself as 850 millitesla at some high field, right? And then basically do this squid loop measurements. And that's the raw data shown on the left-hand side. And as you can see, the star, which is the peak of one of these oscillations, is basically increasing, but then it does a jump. And the, the slow increase, we understand in a normal space picture, but the jump is kind of unexpected. So if you actually try to plot this, this phase shift on the right-hand side, uh, you can actually see a very interesting um, correlation. When I'm measuring S and S, so one of them is always parked at minus, let's say, 3 volts. The other one is minus 3 volts, and then I will slowly increase it. Uh, you will actually see the relative phase of the junctions are zero. So basically, I'm going from zero to 800 millitesla. I get all this data on the left-hand side for different magnetic field. The relative phase is zero. And then, uh, you know, for the ones that one is actually is at the high positive gate voltage, there is a discontinuous jump um, to a number that looks like pi, right? I mean, there is some spread and some of it is actually is experimental because the period of these discrete oscillations are about, uh, you know, I think it's six microtesla. But if we do like a half a day experiment, we can actually get a, a good resolution. And a lot of times we have to repeat it because the magnet jumps. So this, this, this graph shown here, I think it took about three months to actually get reliable data that we can present. Um, so with all the scatterings, uh, I, I think it, it shows that basically there is a phase jump. If you do have my runner fermion, the phase should lock to a pi value. Uh, I don't know enough theory to say if that pi value is a universal number or not, or it's just the way that we measure it, it could have some uh, other number. But anyway, one, one, one way that you can actually double check this is that you can actually tilt your magnetic field 10 degrees off. And, and I mentioned that there is a very sensitive uh, angle dependence, right? So when you are at 10 degrees, you see there is no gate, you know, the gap closing or the current, supercurrent closing. So basically the supercurrent in a very strange way is going straight up. So if you repeat the phase measurement here, uh, which is shown in the right-hand side, you see that actually there is no continuous jump anymore, discontinuous jump anymore, right? So basically the phase just increases the way that you're measuring it. And if you think about it, it could be that, you know, at some point, you know, at 20 degrees, you have S wave at zero, let's say you have P wave. And then if it's in the middle, you may have a mixed order. So you get some enhancement, um, but that's obviously yet to be seen. So once you make a Josephson junction long enough, in principle, you can apply, you know, a magnetic field at the fixed gate voltage or easier is actually to park yourself at some high magnetic field and basically um, um, sweep the gate voltage, right? Because it, basically my y-axis is now a spin orbit and my um, is fixed at the magnetic field. So you see that basically there are multiple junctions with very different characteristics that they do some sort of a supercurrent closing. Uh, some of them are nicer than the other ones. Some of, some of them just have a hint of it. Uh, but, but qualitatively, at least, uh, it's not just one sample that shows that. Um, we also had a very interesting detour. Our ALD was broken. Usually when it's not broken, uh, we get the data that is shown on the top right. So basically, uh, you can tune the supercurrent and uh, with minus 10 volt, uh, because we deposit 60 nanometer of aluminum oxide, we can basically turn off the supercurrent. So without the ALD, we said, okay, you know, let's just put uh, boron nitride on top of uh, a graphite gate and then basically put it on top of this device. And, and that actually worked. So we have a Josephson junction. Let me see, I have a SM measure, right? Uh, we have a Josephson junction, you put HPN over it, you put graphite, you put tight gold, the junction is dashed line red. And now with minus three volt, uh, we can actually turn on the supercurrent because now the HPN is only five nanometer instead of 60 nanometer. But the dielectric actually doesn't help you that much because it's higher in the aluminum oxide. But then, you know, for fun, you can apply this uh, at 650 millitesla when we actually apply the gate voltage. You kind of see another hint of a closing, I want to say, in the lower left. Uh, I think this is interesting just because uh, HPN has a very completely different chemistry at the surface compared to aluminum oxide, right? So if something happening weird at the surface uh, should basically completely change the device characteristic. Um, in this, and we also learned from this device that, you know, aluminum critical field, critical temperature and field highly depends on the thickness. So when we do ALD deposition, actually it apparently removes a few uh, layers of aluminum, making it thinner 
So this is made on the similar devices that we do ALD on. And with the HPN, obviously, it doesn't attack the aluminum. So the critical field is actually around uh, 650, 700 millitesla, while under the other devices, we actually get quite a bit. So it's, I think this is about, I want to say, 12 nanometer, and the other ones are, uh, are smaller. Anyway, um, so let, let's say, you know, I guess we can argue this is correct or not. I think we have a lot of good arguments that um, uh, what we are looking at is actually an interesting physics. Uh, but uh, I really like actually the recent article that uh, Ramon and uh, Leo basically just wrote on uh, physics today that, you know, can we claim that we have Myrana? Maybe, maybe not, or the answer is, I guess we cannot. Um, and the next step is most important, right? I mean, if you have an interesting uh, physics with the non-abelian statistics, which is the key to all of the excitement, uh, you have to be able to fuse them. You have to be able to braid them. You have to look at the state degeneracy. And if we can do that, that's now this whole thing, I guess, is going to the next phase. Um, so in, in our case, what I showed you on the, I mean, uh, on so far is the top right. So I have a superconductor, I have a big gate, I apply a magnetic field in the X direction, and I guess in, in the longer junction, and it destabilizes my runner fermions at the end, right? And to move the Myronas, I guess I read these proposals from 2011 by Jason Alessia, and then uh, later by Bauer and all that, that if you have a keyboard gate, in principle, you can actually move my runners. I don't know about the progress on that, but you know, if aluminum is right above it, maybe it's difficult to change the chemical potential. In our case, uh, I'm showing it on the, I guess, uh, lower right. It's just trivial, right? Because the, the gate is only talking to the semiconductor. So I can basically make that one big gate to a small gates uh, and, and then claim that, you know, with my phase diagram, if I am at a positive, let's say two volt, I have topological phase. So I, with the right magnetic field, I will be in that regime. And when I go lower, I will have S phase where I can deplete the whole thing. So that would become a new playground. Um, so we have made these devices, this SCM image of it. So basically the blue is the aluminum. Uh, the junction is right under those five gates in the center. And on the side, the CQPC is for read out. Um, so basically, I guess uh, schematically, I'm showing it on the right-hand side what it, what it is. So basically you have these five mini gates they are about, I want to say 600 nanometer spaced out by 50 nanometer. And basically it covers the whole junction. Um, so obviously, I mean, there's a lot of experiments that you can do to sort of understand if the device is working or not. You know, some of the easy ones are, you can basically deplete the three middle gates on the top and just turn on the gates on the side, right? Then you basically have a squid loop because you have two aluminum and the current can go only from the top and bottom. On the top right, you see the data for it. I guess I should have adjusted the X axis, but that's magnetic field. That's the current we're sending to the magnet. So you see a very nice um, squid loop oscillation. Um, on the lower, you can turn on the two middle ones and then deplete basically the top middle and the lowest one. And again, you see a squid oscillation. And if you calculate the period, it actually matches exactly uh, with the way that the geometry is. So this is great. Um, one thing then you can make it complicated, right? Because I was depleting, it was easy to understand the data. Now I can play with uh, gate voltage, a little bit more current in the middle, a little bit less current on the edge or, or vice versa. And obviously you get the uh, various from Hoffer looking slash squid data, right? So then we kind of got into the game of uh, current reconstruction. Uh, let me actually come back to that slide. Um, so, I mean, this is an old problem from 1971. There are recipes that how you can do it. Obviously, the, the more beautiful the data is and the more oscillations you have, you can actually do this quite better. But now we have done this, I guess, optimization uh, code that actually you get the data, it generates uh, what it might have looked like, and then it basically feeds it to this algorithm. And then you kind of find out uh, the current distribution uh, because you know the, the black, I guess, on the right-hand graph is what you basically ideally want, but what you would get because of all these uh, few oscillations, you get this round shape uh, of the blue and orange, and they are slightly different, but I'm not gonna get to the details why. Um, so you can actually see where the current is going, how it's going. And, and if we can kind of understand that uh, from the theory point of view, what I can do is uh, I can make a two my run on one side, two my run on the other, a pair on one side, a pair on the other side, and then basically extend them out. I have a choice, I guess, to fuse them in the middle or not, or basically bring them together, let them interact and bring them back, like the proposal by Bauer et al, uh, that basically gives you a Rabi oscillation and an unprotected Myrana. And if that happens, I guess if you can get to Myrana, then uh, 
I guess two pairs of my runners. Uh, then I guess uh, the fusion is, is, is a possibility and one can actually look at it. So, so these experiments in magnetic field, uh, we're, we're collecting data and, and it's actually very good progress. So I'm gonna leave that and then very quickly look at the materials perspective again. Um, I guess, you know, the, the nanofabrication is, is one part of this game because we have to make complicated devices at the end. And, you know, gallium arsenide is, is very well known for, for this. It has a much better history, but the G factor is not good. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, indium antimonide is great with the parameters, but, you know, doing fab is not easy. Uh, so we actually ask ourselves, you know, what is the best 3 5 material? Let's just go to the end of it and <laughs> see what we get. Um, it turns out indium arsenide, 0.4 and terminal 0.6, if you look at the table on top, has about uh, 120 G factor, which is, like, sounds very exciting, right? You know, then uh, indium arsenide is 15, close to 150. Um, so, but, you know, we did some calculations and it turns out, you know, the, you know, the grass is not very green. Um, so if you look at the spin orbit, uh, indeed, it, it is the highest around the composition that you wanted. But now we have to make a quantum well out of this, right? The, the numbers I gave you before and it's down here is for bulk material. So the moment you confine the structure, the spin orbit goes down. I'm sorry, um, the, the spin orbit actually, the alpha parameter, the K linear goes up, but the G factor goes down. So let's look at the right graph first and then we go to the left one. So on the right graph, uh, you will see the G factor plotted, um, uh, for different uh, three different quantum wells, x-axis is the composition. So the left-hand side of that graph is indium arsenide, right-hand side is indium antimonide. And if you look at the 10 nanometer quantum well, you will see that you're maximally gonna get the G factor of 20, kind of in the middle. If you increase it to 20 nanometer, you now are gonna get 40 around 0.7. And then if you increase it to 30 nanometer, you get it even higher. You're becoming basically bulk light, right? So a very thick quantum well is great for G factor. On the other side, if you are looking at the Rajpa spin orbit, basically it's the opposite effect, right? Uh, if you go to the left graph, you will see that for a 10 nanometer, now you have such a confinement at the surface that it gives you a very strong uh, Rajpa parameter. So how the Russell house plays a role here? We actually include it and then we just do a K linear fit uh, around the gamma point. I'm not sure how well that captures it, that I will leave it uh, for the theory. Uh, but uh, the definitely you don't get the G factor that we want to get when we usually make a quantum well of 20 nanometer. So we actually grew a 20 nanometer quantum well at the surface. We grew a, try to grow a pitaxial aluminum on it. It's not as easy as in your arsenide because you have now these two group fives. The, the TM looks not bad. Um, if you look at the two deck property, I'm showing it on the lower right. There is Rubnikov the house is actually an interesting system. It shows the beating. The beating doesn't make sense for a two sub band, so it must be a spin, even the quantum well widths and all the number. And if you make a Josephson junction, it actually shows supercurrent, right? So if we make the same Josephson junctions apply the field, in principle, we should see the same uh, Majorana physics. So that is kind of in progress, but this kind of materials take forever to actually fab and then work on. So there are lots of, I think, excitement in, in the 2D case and in the Josephson junction physics. Uh, th these are the experiments, I guess, for the future, but, you know, a zigzag junction that, you know, Antoine proposed, I think it's a very good quick experiment for us. Uh, we have actually had some data on that. Um, the, the cross junctions, you know, with the squid loops, uh, that's also super interesting because now you can do phase biasing or not, or have it locked or, you know, like the earlier experiments try to do phase measurements. And then uh, you can basically put multiple gates, you can do uh, you know, readout from the site. I think there will be a lot of uh, interesting and excitement coming out of this in the next year or so. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, th thank you, Javad, for the talk. And then uh, now it's open for discussion. So if you want to ask questions, raise your hand. Let us see the... Attila, can, uh, can I ask you a question? Yes, uh, Alfredo, please. Um, Hello, thank you for the for the talk. Um, very very interesting. So, uh, the only the only evidence you have for the topology of superconductivity is the closing of, of the gap um, from the from Fraunhofer pattern. Can you also get some evidence of the current distribution, or to see if you you have Majoranas? Uh, 
So, the, so let, let me go back here. So I mean, we have two evidence, right? One is basically this uh, supercurrent closing, and then the other one is the phase measurement. So these are like two separate measurements, right? One of them have a squid loop, one of them is single junction. So in a single junction like this, we can obviously look at front hopper pattern as I go make cuts horizontally. Uh, if you look at the where we call P wave on the right hand side, the supercurrent is only 20 nanogram. And it's just, we have done, we have attempted to do front hopper, but it's very difficult uh, to be in field and actually get a reasonable front hopper pattern. We can see some sort of a period changing and all that, but that just, I think is within error bars at least for now. Okay, thank you. Um, can I also quickly ask something before I uh, give the floor to Charlie? So, um, uh, so this um, super current closing, so what distinguishes between the, this proposed uh, S to P uh, transition from uh, just a conventional zero to pi transition. Is it would, I think, uh, essentially generate the same type of feature. It is. I think it's that's why I think the theory is very important, right? I mean, the zero pi you can get it without the spin orbit, right? You can get it with the spin orbit, which becomes almost the same physics. But what is really important, I think, it's to go back to the Taoist energy and all that. And uh, surprisingly, uh, where, where, where did I talk about this here? Surprisingly, the parameter regime is just the opposite of what it should be uh, in, in your Marcinite. In Mercury Telluride, this is much harder to argue. And we have a table, I guess, in, in, in this archive paper that uh, everything that has been observed as topological actually quite makes sense with the BFFLO fields, except in your Marcinite, because you are at too high of a density and very small uh, Ls. So, you know, I mean, and these are the only relevant energies in the junction, right? I mean, if your talus doesn't make sense and uh, your Zeman doesn't make sense. Uh, so for this, if you do the simulation, let me actually show you something super, I, I think is very interesting. So in, in, in Pianca proposal, I mean, I, I think it was the first version and, and it was very illuminating, but there are lots of, I guess, uh, it's not the whole picture maybe. Uh, so here we are doing two kind of calculations. Um, and without going to too much details, like the top panels are for the low density, the lower panels are for high density, right? So for low density, which is um, basically very similar to, I guess, what Pienka uh, is doing, but again, it's not exactly the same. You don't get this from Pienka, is that the, the red is where the, the phase transition happens, and then uh, the, the black is where the supercurrent closes. And as you see, they are relatively at the same place, right? So you say it totally makes sense. I do a phase transition, supercurrent closes. If you do calculation uh, for, again, our parameter space, but higher mu, what you will see is that the phase transition actually happens where the circle is, around 0.5 is kind of the same number. But uh, the supercurrent actually closes way after. So it actually takes time for the system to phase lock to pi. So, the fact that you see supercurrent closing, it's a very good evidence that something is happening. Whether that point is exactly where the phase transition happens or not, it really depends on the details. But basically going back to this idea of, uh, um, as you said, uh, the, the pi junction, you know, with, you know, with or without, I think if, if we have looked at all the numbers, at least in our case, and it doesn't, uh, you know, there is the syndium and thermonite uh, data on nature communication okay, at all. So if you look at the parameters, you put the BFFLO fields, it makes perfect sense, right? Um, uh, I, I, we have it in our table. So the, the Fermi velocity is a smaller in indium and thermonite because the density is genetically lower. The L is actually quite large in that paper, is about the micron, I guess. It must be the, the orange graph on here that I'm showing and reference 17. And, and then you expect about the 0.6 Tesla to actually drive it to a BFFLO and, and it totally makes sense. Okay, so it's a quantitative analysis then. I think so, um, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, seems that uh, Charlie has a question, so I just unmute him. Uh, hi, Javad. Uh, thanks, Attila. Uh, can you hear me? I'm, I'm, yes. Yeah, good. Um, I'm, I like this geometry of the SNS, the long SNS junction with the finger gates that produce Majorana's you know, uh, in the middle of, of the junction, that guy, yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess my question is, is, is the theory worked out for what happens to the Fraunhofer pattern when the junction is interrupted by a couple of Majoranas? It, it seems a little bit complicated to me in the sense that maybe there's, 
you know, like single electron physics that mm -hmm. can move laterally across the junction. And maybe there would be something like H over E Fraunhofer uh, rather than H over 2E. But, but then I, I, it, just, it just feels a little, I mean, it seems complicated. And I wonder whether there's a good theoretical guide here. Yeah, so uh, I guess yes and no. So, so I mean, this was what we do. You know, we asked our friends in theory side to actually do the simulation. They have done it. The difficult thing is, uh, at least the easy thing from experiment is that, you know, if I make two my runners, like one of the one that I showed, like this one on the top, you can actually see two current closing gap, depending on the lens of the my runner and the pixelated stuff that you can do. You can do correlation from left and right. So the easy experiment. But for the actual experiment, it turns out to do a V-junction is a lot easier than a straight junction because the theory, um, let, let, let's say I want to make two my runners and then fuse them. In this particular case, I can only fuse them in the middle or I have to come back. So that will be basically double uh, interaction. Okay, but, but, but sorry to interrupt, but just before, I mean, before we do anything fancy, let's just say you, you go back, like, let's just say you had the exact condition of the figure on the right, like the schematic okay. thing, cars. Okay. And before you worry about fusing them or moving them around right. or anything, if you just had that configuration. Right. Uh, do you know what the Fraunhofer pattern for that looks like? I, I don't, but uh, what I would expect is that basically the green, um, the, the red, if there is supercurrent S wave, will dominate. Because the supercurrent. I kind of, I kind of expect that too, but then I'm, now I'm worried about one electron versus two electron physics. Oh. Um, you know, in other words, it's not Cooper pairs that are going across that Majorana. It's like a, it would be like a Fraunhofer in H over E instead of a Fraunhofer yeah. in H over 2E. Yeah. Anyway, if there are theorists on the on the on the call, <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, because it, I have to say I agree with you, Javad, that this is a that this is a very attractive geometry. That it's uh, like from an experimental point of view, it seems really straightforward and um, easy to do. It just would be really nice if if there was a really clear cut signature that that red region in the middle was really red. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I, I don't know the answer really, but for me, thanks a lot. Yeah. Sure. Uh, are there further questions before we close the session and thank all of our speakers for this session? Yeah, if this is not the case, then uh, yeah, then let's do so. So then let us thank everybody who gave a talk today and everybody who listened and contributed to the discussions. And now as for the group photo, I don't know, Ramon, yeah, please. You, if you turn on your cameras, or, or maybe everybody can make a screenshot in the computer. So all cameras are on. Just make a screenshot. <laughs> so so we clap <laughs> yeah, it's been a great session actually yeah this this has been kind of an experiment for some of us but it seems to work everyone you can unmute it. All the, all the yeah, please let me. Please unmute. I think you can unmute yourselves now. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Great Thank session. You. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs> So see you see you tomorrow. We also have a very nice program. Yeah. See you. Yeah, see Thank you, you for tuning in. Bye. Thank you.